And welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Kuehl Show. I am your host today, the insider of the insiders, Tyler Kuehl. And we have us a big pack show today, everyone. And Tyler, your screen looks a little funny right now. I'm like, yes, because we have someone waiting just on this side of me over here on the chat because we got video chat once again today. We got a bunch of great guests lined up for you today here on 12 Ounce Sports, whether you're watching us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Thank you very much. If you're watching on Zingo TV as well, channel 761 on there, use the promo code 12 ounce. That's 12 O Z or Z for all of you proper English users. Today is, of course, as our show is sponsored by mybookie.ag. We'll get to all of our sponsors a little bit later on and Second String Leather Company because on the line right now, I say on the line right now, like it's on a phone. No, live right <clears throat> now, live and in person, we have us our first guest on the show today. She is none other than the head coach of the expansion National Women Hockey League's Toronto Six. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the legendary coach herself. It is Digit Murphy. Digit, how are you doing today? Woo woo. I feel like we should have uh, some kind of audience in the background. You need that music. Uh. I, I'm saying I, let's we see, need what, that. Let's see. What do we I need got that. here? I let's got, see. You got I something? Got, go. I, I got the, I got yes. the, yes, I got the who going in the background. Yeah, that'll work. Right. But yeah. All right. Can I do some dancing? I, hey, you forgot. I'm also the president of this, this, this organization. The, Don't forget that. The president. I was reading so fast. I skipped yeah. on over it. The president and head coach well, of the Toronto six, you know, El, El Presidente, right? No. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I actually was the president, and then during COVID, because this whole season is just, you know, what kind of show it is, you know, that kind of show, uh, <laughs> and I just was like, they're like, can you can you coach too? I'm like, I can coach. I can coach. I can president. I can come up to Toronto. I can be in lockdown right now. Whatever uh, it takes, Tyler. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, that's perfect. Well, the, f the funny thing is, is that because when I think when we because uh, like I said before on the show, a lot of my guests come from LinkedIn. It said president at first. I'm like, oh, cool. We got the president. And I looked at him like, wait, she's the head coach, too. I'm like, hey, it's a double it's a double win for everybody. I mean, like, that's uh, how did. So we'll get it, it to um, with the I guess with the current situation, the six right now. But let's talk about how that all started off for you, Digit, because you started off, like you said, as the president and then became the head coach of an expansion National Women's Hockey League team right after this was the year after the Canadian women's hockey league, a league that you coached in for a little bit shut down. How did that all kind of come to fruition for you to be part of the new Toronto team in the national women's hockey league? Well, if I told you I had to kill you. So next question, no, just <laughs> kidding. Uh, it was, uh, it was a interesting story. Um, started back when I met Joanna Boynton again in January of 2020. Um, I am a Cornell alum and she's a Harvard alum. And we ended up seeing each other at a Harvard Cornell game. I was up there, you know, I, I live in Providence, Rhode Island uh, originally. That's where I hail from. Go Providence. Go Providence. And uh, the Friars. Yeah. Go, go, well, now, well, not, Brown, not, come now on. you were coaching, I know, of course. I know, all those, I know all those jokes about Brown, but they're not true. Brown's a great place. I love the Friars too. But, anyways, so. I was up. Uh, I was up at this game because you know how they have those um, alumni things. They're like everyone from Boston, come cheer on the Big Red, come to Harvard. So I went there and you know got to got to go hang out with a couple of my buddies, and consequently they were also having the Harvard alumni event there. So okay. there were a bunch of Harvard players back, like Caitlin Kehau, Kate Buser. It was awesome. Um, uh, Lauren uh, McCullough, all these kids that I had coached against, but they also were part of like pro professional hockey. And I ran into Jojo. I'm like, what are you doing here? And she's like, what are you doing here? And next thing you know, we're yipping and yapping. And she's like, oh, I'm, I'm a minority owner in the pride. And we'd love to get you back in the mix just to, you know, talk, maybe consult. So I'm like, cool. And at the time I had, uh, I was in, I was, I was, uh, funding a startup, which was, um, uh, a placement tool for women athletes with companies. And, um, it was great. And we were going and we were rocking and rolling. And I had been talking to Joanna, Joanna, and next thing you know, COVID hits, right? So we're like, Oh, great. So my startup kind of had to go on hold. Who knows when we're going to start that up again. And Joe was like, Hey, we got this job. Would you be interested? And uh, talk to her and uh, her husband, John and Miles are known who are the owners. Uh, they talked about Tyler Taminia coming on board. And I just, 
I couldn't say no to those guys. Like working with these people who are passionately committed to the game and to the financial model of the franchise ownership, that sold me. I think for all the years that I've been involved in hockey, I haven't seen a model that was going to be sustainable. But with this team of people who actually cared about the game and about about the sustainability model of the business and about women, it was like the perfect storm for me to get involved. And that's how I be became the president. Um, and then, yeah, the rest is history. It's It's been a great ride. It's been wild. It's COVID. But um uh, I'm looking forward to not only the end of this season, but the beginning of next season where we actually can play, um, you know, can play. I guess everyone, no, I mean, no one's playing now. Like, what's up with that? We got to play. That That is, I mean, that's a really yeah. good question because obviously there's a lot of stuff going on in Ontario and we, you know, we're, we're here in Michigan and we're all, you know, we're not in a quite the whole shutdown, but we're heading in that direction. But we'll get to that here in just a second, Digit. The, one of the, biggest questions was when the CWHL folded, like I said, you were in the league for a couple of years. You coached with the Boston Blades. You were the coach of the, one of the, the first teams in China coaching Kunlin Red Star. And there was the discussion of how the financial models work. And that's why the CWHL folded and the NWHL was continuing to go on. What from just the few months that you've been around with the six and being the president of the franchise that you've seen, that is the biggest difference between those two leagues from your time in Boston and in China to now with Toronto, what is the biggest difference and why do you think this league can work with the current financial setup that it has now? Yeah, Ty, that's a great question. Um, you know, I've, I, I ask about the sustainability model for women's sports every day of my life, right? I mean, I've been doing this since 1972 and, and how do we look at sports differently from a female lens? And I think what they're doing is taking the best of both worlds, which is the men's traditional model that we have now and infusing it with yeah, Ty, uh, that's a great question. leadership um, model that will sustain. And the thing that I see about this ownership group is they're, they're okay with it being a marathon, not a sprint. And by that, I mean that you need to nurture and grow the sport and stay in it for a while and actually grow it. The biggest problem with the CWHL, and you saw it, was that it was a league ownership model that didn't ever franchise and you need to franchise. So you're in the individual markets. So the cities and the fans can embrace that team in a way that only that, that city and that ownership, the, those owners and those fans know. I think it's really hard when you have a league centric model that doesn't really understand the nuances of the cities, you know? And I think that that's where I see the biggest jump that the NWHL did six years in. Do you know what I'm saying? Like the, yeah. the C dub stayed in that that, you know, we gotta have the league on it. We gotta have control. We gotta control control. And sometimes, just like in coaching, giving up control is how you win in the long run. Because when you coach, you can't be in their ear every day, right? You gotta actually teach them the game and then they grow it the way they need to grow their game, just like we are in our financial model. So, right. And that's, and that's really the biggest part too. And you see that too, cause I've, I followed both leagues while they were going at the same time. And it was entertaining because, you know, down in the States, I mean, we, we still have, don't have one yet in Michigan, but you saw, you know, how it was flourishing in, you know, markets, how like the Riveteers have been kind of coming around and Minnesota has always seemed to have a good following Buffalo as well. And in Canada, you know, you saw a little bit with the Furies there towards the end, and it was starting to grow up. They were getting games on Sportsnet. So it was very different the way the exposure of that league was. And now with the CWHL off to the side, now the NWHL takes the forefront. So that's why it's exciting, the fact that there still is a team in Canada with the Toronto Six coming on board here. And that's where we're going to move into now is because they're in the – I mean, right now Ontario is in the middle of a 28-day shutdown. What does that do for your team? Because you guys were practicing, you guys were getting in shape, ready to go. Obviously, the start of the season yeah. was still up in the air. But how now, as a not just a not just the coach, but the you know the person that runs the team, the president, how do you now kind of go forward with trying to continue to get this team ready for an upcoming season, if and when it happens? Well, I think the challenge was always you know practicing in a market that's. I hate to say this, but much more COVID uh, educated because 
let's face it, the reality is, you know, the U.S. is kind of cowboys. We're kind of cowboys down there, right? I'm an American, right? I'm the one that's, you know, I'm the one that's crossing the, they have these stanchions like in the restaurants before they shut it down. And I'd be like going under the stanchion and the, the, the waitress would be like, miss, miss, get back here. I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And I come back and they'd have to like take your temperature and wash your hands and write it down. So this place is really on point when it comes to safety, right? Right. But with that said, it's a disadvantage when you're playing sports when, first of all, you're in two, you, you, you only have groups of 10 that you can have in the arena. Okay. So I would limit it to two coaches and eight players. I am, I don't know if I'm lucky or unlucky enough, but I only have 16 players on my roster. So that actually works out perfectly. So I can have two groups of 10, but it's very difficult. So now that we're on lockdown, um, you know, we're, we're working with our arenas to, you know, get the professional, um, exemption, you know, which hopefully, you know, we can get that. So we'll, we'll manage, right? I mean, we're going to manage by either, you know, driving wherever we have to to play or working with the, um, the uh, facilities to, to get us to be able to play. But I will tell you that no matter what, our team come whenever we play, we'll be ready, whether we have to get out there on ponds or sh with shovels and, you know, street hockey sticks or just just working out and working our brains like we'll be ready because that's how that's how we roll. Like we're the team that comes in and deals with every piece of adversity thrown at us and we'll figure out a way to make lemons out of lemonade. That's what we do. That I mean, that's really all everyone has to do right now. Every team that is training, and I down here, I write for college hockey down here, so I kind of have a kind of a, a feel for how everything's going. And that's for the longest time. Kids were coming in September and like, all right, guys, we don't know when the season's going to start, but let's get on the ice. I mean, because that's all they could do. And now, obviously, they're starting to play. Obviously, COVID's getting in the way of that a little bit, but. I mean, for for the brand new team, you're because right now you're at Canlan Ice Sports, which, by the way, it was the first time I ever went to Toronto. Is that's where I played my tournament? Is my dad? Yeah, actually, baby. My dad's. I think he's watching this right now, and and my wife I actually got to show her there when we went up there. We went up to uh, uh, camp out in Etobicoke back when back when I actually yeah. could play, and my legs were not solid rocks, and I actually was capable. Of being <laughs> play. But but this is such an interesting kind of setup because obviously when Toronto was announced there was not a pandemic. It was, Hey, there's going to be a team next year. Awesome. Cool stuff. And then the pandemic came through and it was like, Oh, well this yeah. is going to throw in the wrench in the plans. And, and I, I just wonder now because obviously we're seeing with the NHL, they don't know when they're going to start. Yeah. The, you see the AHLs, they say they're going to start in February and obviously college hockey is kind of starting, you know, whichever way they can, not in Canada. Unfortunately, U sports says they're not going to have any sports in the winter and fall, but <clears throat> where, do you have any information on when the NWHL, I mean, obviously you want to start in January when it seems like everything may calm down, but has that changed yeah. in recent months or are they just kind of playing it by ear to see, Hey, whenever this slows down, then we can play. I think the challenge of um, being a woman's sport is that a couple things. Number one, you don't have these massive budgets um, that the, you know, the men's sports have <clears throat> or the high level women's sports that are funded you know, the WNBA, for example. So what happens is you're in this kind of space that you need to get really creative. And I think one of the things that, um, <clears throat> God, I don't know what's going on with my, with my voice. I think uh, I've been yelling too much. Um, I think one of the that. things we yell all the time on yeah. the show. So. <laughs> I think, well, trust me, you should see me on the ice. But um, I think one of the things that we're trying to do is, you know, figure that out. I think with Tyler Taminia now as the commissioner, <clears throat> she'll be uh, hoping to pull some rabbits out of her hat uh, because it's really an exciting time to be part of women's hockey. It's an exciting time to see, even though it's COVID, there's so many stories of these young women and what they do by day and then they're hockey players at night. And I think these are some of the stories that need to be told. So COVID or not, we hope to be promoting, you know, our digital uh, products, you know, we've got a digital magazine coming out in Toronto in December. Um, you know, we like to keep people entertained on YouTube and Twitter, but obviously people want to play games. And I think that we're working through some of the pandemic issues, whether it happens in January or March, you know, I'm sure that Tyler Tamini is going to take us into some sort of season 
um, at some point. Right. And if you talk about the digital platform last year, the NWHL <clears throat> starts going on Twitch, which is a big game changer because, you know, with a lot of leagues, junior leagues, especially in college leagues here in the United States and in Canada as well, there's hockey TV, but it's a subscription based uh, kind of <clears throat> view. Twitch is free to anyone and you can watch as much as you want. So it's a great way to get kind of a fan base there and be like, Hey, let's check out, you know, this women's hockey, see how it is and see some of the best women's hockey in the world. And you talk about the digital platform. I made sure I let everyone know in the NWHL, Hey, we got the coach on, but then coming up on there, what's it called? The, the NWHL open ice. You have one of your players, Mikaela Grant Mentis yeah. going on. It's Mentis. Yeah. Right? I said that right. Mentis. Mentis. Oh, M- M- Michaela Grant Mentis. And it's also Riveters, not Riveteers. Riveteers. Oh, I, oh, oh man, I thought I saw it. It's okay. It. No, no, it's all right. I, You know, you have to correct. You know, you can't be afraid. And, you know, it's okay. Everyone it, makes mistakes. It's okay. <clears throat> our, our first live show, we had Jack Michaels on from the Edmonton Oilers, play-by-play guy. And I thought Edmonton was got a first-round by there in the qualifying round. We were five minutes in the interview. He's like, yeah, Tyler, you're wrong. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> And it's hey, broadcast, no big of, deal. Yeah, you know, whatever. It's it's humility. It's awesome. Like I love being on this show. I gotta come on again. Let's yeah. go. So the the biggest thing is because you talk about how this is probably the I I would say personally in my experience as well, this is probably the peak for popularity for women's hockey. I think I don't want to say in sports history, but at least in my lifetime, because you're seeing so much attention being gravitated towards the sport with the three on three challenge last year and the year before that, Kendall coin going in the, in the Brianna Decker going into the all-star skills competition. And you've been around this game digit for, I mean, you played back in the early eighties when it wasn't even an NCAA sport. NCAA didn't adopt women's hockey until the new millennium. I mean, how have you seen you in your time playing the game and coaching the game for over 20 years at Brown, by the way, which was the first program women's college <laughs> hockey program. I did my, you have time. done your homework, young man. I love you. Yes, I did my homework. Riveteers. I did it all right. Um, but, okay. but how have you seen the game change from very humble beginnings in the Northeast part of the United States till going all the way across and having players come from not just the hotbeds up in the North, but having players come from kind of further South and your Chicago's and out and out West and all across North America for that matter. How have you seen the game grow in your time around the sport? You do not have enough airtime for that conversation. I will tell you. Um, it has been, it's interesting because yes, it's grown in, let's see, how many years has it been? 50 Almost fifty years since nineteen seventy two. Title nine. Just I didn't want to. I didn't want to drop the big five zero number because I knew you played. Like I said back in the eighties, which was over forty. No, years I mean ago. I I I make no bones about it. I'm I'm going to be fifty nine, and um I'm I'm proud to be fifty nine and have the experience that I have and still have the passion, you know, to grow the game that I have. And it really actually comes from the fact that in fifty years, um I think it I think it already should have arrived. Right. I, I'm constantly challenging the establishment to make women part of the conversation. But with that said, since the Olympics in 1998, I mean, it's really taken off, right? And it was, I know that they played Canada in the gold medal game and and Canada lost, but I think for women's hockey to grow, it had to start, we had to win. The U.S. had to win just because, you know, we're very um, economy driven and the, the way that uh, people view sports in the U S is just different. It, they, they throw money at it. Right. So when the winner wins, they throw money at you in the U S. So I think that that was huge. But when I started playing in 1983, uh, sorry, 1979, we were the first recruited class at Cornell um, to actually be recruited. Uh, you know, we, we brought in five or six players, which was huge. You got Tyler. We drove in vans we had folding metal chairs. You probably never even saw them. You're so young. Like they used to be well, metal was and it, they were freezing the, cold. Was it the Volkswagen vans? The Those? No, I'm oh. talking about the, yeah, no, it wasn't. It was no, 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 not those. Those are buses. Those are, oh, come on. No, those are the hippie vans. No, these were like those. those uh, Cornell. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it could have been, you're right. But I'm talking about those folding chairs that were like metal and freezing. Like those are our seats. And we had like no equipment was purchased. It was, it was, it was tough. But to see 
the NCAA take hold of it in the uh, early 2000s and to be part of that drive um, was was amazing. Um, we actually, in USA Hockey, we actually wrote the grant back in the late 90s to actually have USA Hockey, and you probably don't know this, you should look up your history. Um, we actually had USA Hockey fund the first ever unsanctioned championship, the precursor to the NCAA. It was called the A. AWHCA championship. Yeah, the, the and all, those the three women, years. Women's hockey alliance. Yep. I do remember that. Yep. Yep. So so from that, you know, we're part of that conversation. I mean, I'm so proud to be part of all of this history because it's really cool. And then from that, the NCAA takes it over. And the second the NCAA took it over, Tyler, that's when everything split and that's when money got thrown at it. You know, programs started to crop up, as you mentioned, Minnesota, Chicago all those places. Uh, California was a big hotbed, believe it or not, back in the day. Um, not back in the day, but in the 2000s, I remember recruiting some kids from out there. So, um, you know, that was cool. And then I think the pro hockey kind of um, uh, evolution happened in the early, no, 2000, 2012, 13, right around the CWHL's, you know, fifth or sixth years. And here's why, Tyler. I want to educate you here. Educate it's me. because it's because originally when USA Hockey and Hockey Canada used to um, used to grow their their base of of Olympians, their base used to come only from NCAA right. players because there was no place for them to play. If you look up Angela Ruggiero, Kimmy Granato, they had to play in men's beer league, right? right. Haley Wickenheiser, all those guys. So. They invented and created, and it happened out west. Like Haley Wickenheiser was part of that first growth. I can't remember the name of it. It was like the NWHL, I think. It was the original NWHL Yes, way in back the way. 2000s. Yeah, yeah. But they needed those programs, Tyler, to grow their Olympic pool. Okay? Right. What has happened? Think about this. So now you grow them up. You have six teams, CW, six teams in the NW, we expand to China. So now you have all this kind of movement with professional women's players that now are part of what? The Olympic pool, okay? When the CWHL got, they took away 120 opportunities for Canadians, well, not really only Canadians, but Canadian athletes now to grow their pool. So I think we need to really talk about how professional women's hockey not only helps the women, stay relevant, stay relevant in the pro hockey, but it also helps the NGBs, the USA Hockeys, the Hockey Canada, as well as kids from Sweden and all that. So, you know, we really need to get our act together in women's sports and work together. There's, you know, all this PW, NW, let's all work together and let's grow opportunities for women and make better athletes and make a better planet. Yeah, okay, I'll shut up now. Cause it's great because the fact that, you know, we're in a non-Olympic year and we're talking about women's hockey, like it's like, it's prevalent. Cause we talk about 98 and 98 till probably the 2010 games in Vancouver. That was the only times you really cared about it, was every four years. Right. And occasionally someone right. obviously watched the world championships, but it wasn't the biggest thing. I remember last year complaint. I remember I, I, I did my whole dissection on the, on the gold medal game in the last year's world championships. Cause it was such a big game and it was a big event because now it's the point where, yeah, everyone wants to, everyone should want to watch women's hockey. And, and, and how about, how about that last game? Let's talk about that last game when Finland won. Finland won that game. Thank you. That's what you're talking about. That thinks that I would, I, I should of, have grabbed the audio. Of course they board. won. Of course they won. Did you watch it? There was a wrong call by the ref. Total wrong call. I'm oh. sorry, but it was wrong. It was wrong. I, you it's know, wrong call. that was in the middle of the playoffs and I, and I cheer a little bit for the Leafs. I don't know if you can see my, my Leafs mug here. I, but, yeah. and so I was, as, as the Leafs were losing to Boston, once again, I was accepting that fact. It was going to be another <laughs> great seven game. Just absolute Go Bruin. fire. Yeah. Go Bruin. Yeah. 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 Go Bruin. My dad's going to get in the chat. He's like, ha, see Leafs suck. All right. But anyway, but it was the same game. It was right after Kadri got suspended, but that was the headline story for that show because I, first of all, I couldn't believe it was such a, just a bad call. And I, myself, if I ever met George Peros in person, him and I, NHL player safety and I in this show really don't get along that well, just because I disagree so much. And now it's like to the international game. And I'm like, how can you make such a bad, like this is your best official crew and they blow it. And cause yeah. think of it this way, 
and you've seen it too. We talked about 98, 2002. 2006 was a little bit of a funnier, but 010 and 14. It's always seeming to be, especially in the World Championships, U.S. and Canada. How big yep. would that have been to have a team Huge. not named U.S. and Canada, Finland, Huge. in their Huge. own barn to win that, it? That would have been great. That, for women's that was awful for women's hockey that they blew that call. I was I was out of my mind because, you know, first of all, uh, you know, Nora, you know, she played for me, Ben Lahovi, like yep. uh, uh, Anina, like those guys deserve to win that game. And it was funny because I think I, I think I texted bells on the side, like you guys deserve to lose or something like that, you know, cause I know, still know those guys and they're always like, ah, I did, you know, but I call it like it is right. I mean, right. that was a bad call, but we, we don't want to talk about that because we don't talk about negative. We want to talk about positive women's hockey. People should watch it. They should subscribe to the Toronto six YouTube channel. They should su subscribe to us on Twitter, um, Instagram, I mean, it, it really is something I think fans are going to really want to hear about. Like, you know, we are going to do these three pillars of our, um, of our program, education, inclusion, and empowerment. Those are our three core values. And everything will be wrapped around those kind of stories, the way we do appearances, the way we get out in the community, because that's really what you have to do uh, if you want to get out and get people to care about women's sports, it really has to be community driven. The CWHL did a great job with that, but now how do you take those moments and monetize them? And I think it's perfect for a digital world. And that's what, um, the Toronto six is, is going to be doing, um, uh, you know, this year and next year as much as we can. So I, I just can't thank you enough for, you know, allowing me to be on the show and to grow our brand because it takes, it takes everyone. It takes ability. It takes people like you to really care and notice women's hockey for us to uh, get our traction. So I just want to thank you, Tyler, for having me on the show. Well, I appreciate taking the time, Coach Digit. And I, I'll, I'll go on one more thing here. By the way, at the Toronto Six on Twitter, at the dot Toronto Six on Instagram. That's a little bit of a change there, but yeah. like I said, make sure you check out the Toronto Six's YouTube. And Digit, of course, is kind enough to follow our show here on Instagram, which you all should as well, at The Kula Show. Yeah. And I did a little look, and I went on your profile there, and you've been doing a series of videos recently <laughs> called 37 Seconds for Title IX. Yeah. Because, as you yeah. say, Title IX only has 37 words in it. Look it up, which is legit. Look it up. So look it up. 37 seconds here, Digit, right before we let you go here. 37 seconds to explain to people why people should watch and follow women's hockey. This is Digit Murphy, 37 seconds, because Title IX only has 37 words. Look it up. You should come watch the Toronto Six because we're fun, fast, and furious. We care about education, empowerment, and inclusion. And if you don't watch, you're missing out. That's Digit Murphy, 37 seconds, because Title IX only has 37 words. Out. Nice. That is how we end it. Mic drop. Mic drop. Well, don't drop that mic. That mic looks expensive. There you go. Don't this is a great that. mic. I got I get sponsored by these guys. Oh, nice. You should get one. You should get one. It's a really I should cool mic. get one. I got these headsets relatively cheap too. Audio Technica, and I got them from. Well, no, this is real. This is legit. Legit. So, I will definitely have to look into that. Legit. Digit is legit. All right, Tyler, you're a rock star, man. Thank Anytime. you. Thank you very much. Digit Murphy, head coach and president of the Toronto Six, joining us here on the Kuehl Show. We'll take a quick break, folks. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more women's hockey, some NHL stuff, some college hockey. We'll be talking about everything here on the Kuehl Show. We'll be back right after this. And let me get a commercial. <laughs>
Drink Aid, ready for distribution worldwide. <laughs> And welcome back, everyone, here to the Cule Show here on 12 Ounce Sports. Whether you're watching us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Did I say Instagram? I said Instagram. Dang it. I almost had them all. I always say Instagram because Instagram is such a good way to connect with people now. I never, We never used it early on in our show's history, but we started doing that, and that was okay. But we must thank our sponsors once again because I didn't have a whole lot of time to do it the first time. But that's okay because that was a fun interview, right, with Digit Murphy? She's cool. She's fun to follow on Instagram, at Digit Murphy on Instagram. Be sure to follow her there and follow the Toronto Six because she po- she posts for their Instagram as well during practice. So much energy she has, even almost as much energy as I do. But then again, I've only had half a cup of coffee right now, and I've on about three hours of sleep because I got to do the morning shift today at the radio station. Wasn't that fun? But let's get into it now. We're going to be talking. We'll bring on our next, well, I say next guest, but He's only sort of a guest because he's supposed to be here. But regardless, we'll get to Alex here in just a second. Second String Leather Company. Yeah, no, I was on the right side. That right up there. You can't see it. There it is. MyBookie.ag down there. Make sure you bet. On, if you're going to bet on sports right now, be sure to bet on the Lions not beating an XFL quarterback. You can put money down on that. MyBookie.ag, 12-ounce sports. Use that promo code and win and get paid using MyBookie.ag. We're going to get now into the a new, or well, it's a newer segment, if you will. It is something I like to call the awesome and relatively new, as I can't find the, the I had a background for it. Where is it? There it is. Okay, here we go. We're getting the hang of it here on the Kula show as I throw this in the background. We have ourselves college hockey scoreboard time here on 12 Ounce Sports. We got a big weekend of action to recap here. Thursday in Big Ten action, number six Michigan beats number 14 Wisconsin by a score of 5-2 to two in their first game. Michael Paschow leading the Wolverines with two goals there. Strauss Mann, 26 saves in the game. Minnesota beat Penn State on Thursday night, number 11 Minnesota, that is, winning 4-1. to one. Jack LaFontaine, 26 saves. Scott Reedy and a goal and an assist for the Gophers. Arizona State, Michigan State tying one apiece in their first game. And Long Island University, their first game in their program's history, they win in overtime despite getting outshot 41 to 15. Garrett Metcalf, 39 saves for the Long Island Sharks. He was outstanding. Christian Rajic, Rajic, the former Alabama Huntsville Charger, with the game-winning goal. On Friday, Michigan finished their weekend sweep with a 2-1 win in overtime over the Badgers. Thomas Borlo with a highlight real goal. That's who was his third point of the weekend. Robbie Baydoon, though, still playing well for the Gophers. He looked really solid in net for the Badgers looking good with 34 saves. He's a big guy. Come, like I said, Michigan Tech transfer playing well for Wisconsin. Minnesota gets the weekend sweep over Penn State with the 3-2 win. Scott Reedy, another goal for him for the Gophers. Two for three on the power play were the Gophers. They were looking really good during just with the special teams. They were looking solid and effective 
over the Nittany Lions. Jack LaFontaine, 34 saves. Michigan State picks up their first win on the game on Friday night. The Mitchells lead the way. Mitchell Matson and Mitchell Lewandowski, the goal scorers for the Spartans. In the one game in Hockey East action, non-conference, but it was between two teams. That was UConn and UMass. Number seven, UMass winning 5-1. to one. Oliver Chow, goal and assist. Minutemen outshot the Huskies in that game by a 46-22 to 22 margin. As we move over to Saturday, only three games because a couple games had to be canceled in the Hockey East. A lot of COVID problems going on up there. UMass beating UConn by a score of three, or UConn beating UMass, excuse me, three to two in a shootout. The first official shootout in Hockey East history. They just adopted the rule for this season. UConn trailed 2-0 in the first period, but they were able to come back and win. Tomasz Vomachka, the goaltender for UConn, 35 saves in the win. Michigan Tech went up over across the Upper Peninsula to play Lake Superior State. Lake Superior State won 1-0 in a shootout. Great game for Merrick's men's 28 saves. Ashton Calder, the game-winning goal in the shootout. Non-conference action, Alabama-Huntsville fell to Robert Morris 5-2. A weird game. David Fessenden, the starter for the Chargers, went down in the third period while warming up. And unfortunately, the Chargers, who were actually leading 1-0 going into that third period, were not able to recover. Jordan Timmons, his first two goals of his collegiate career, putting him up by giving them two goals and an assist as well. He looked really confident for the Robert Morris Colonels. On Sunday, Minnesota State takes down Bemidji State in convincing fashion. Reggie Lutz, two goals for the Mavericks, a 5-0 win. Jake Jaremko with three assists. Dryden McKay, 21 save shutout. The candidate for the Mike Richter Award last year was exceptional once again. Lake Superior State completed the weekend sweep over the Michigan Tech Huskies. Pete Vayette and Ashton Calder each had a goal and an assist. Lake Superior State Three goals in the third period to help them go on their way to the win. Holy Cross was able to split the weekend split weekend split, excuse me, over the Long Island Sharks with a 5-2 win in that game. Clarkson, number eight, Clarkson takes down Colgate with a close game. Two to one win there. Chris Olham stopping 23 of 24 for the Golden Knights. And Robert Morris completes the weekend sweep over Alabama Huntsville with a 4-3 win. Nick Perkusich with a goal and two assists. Randy Hernandez, third period game winning goal was his first career goal. Monday night, we have a couple games. We got one going on right now. Penn State taking on Wisconsin. That's on the Big Ten Network. That'll be followed up by a doubleheader of Ohio State taking on Minnesota. The Minnesota State Bemidji State game that was supposed to go on tonight did not because someone on the Mavericks decided that, well, they were going to get COVID. So that is obviously a bummer for sure, unfortunately, because that's just something we've realized, folks, that. We're going to have issues with COVID as we kind of go along here. So, But a lot of great games going on this week. Ohio State and Minnesota, like I said, they're going to play tonight and tomorrow, as will Penn State and Wisconsin. Boston College is now going to play UMass, number two versus number seven, because Boston College is supposed to play Providence. However, that unfortunately didn't happen because Providence now is shut down until the middle of next month. So COVID-19, it's going to be prevalent. It's going to be around the game. But thankfully, we have updates and all that stuff. So don't have to worry about anything else of having issues because I am here to help you report with your college hockey scoreboard. We should get a sponsor for this. Anyways, let's move along here. Bring in our second guest on the show. And I say guest with quotes, obviously, because he's supposed to be sitting next to me here, but he's not right now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the show. Unfortunately, I don't know why I'm still saying this. His name is Alex Kuehl. Hey, Alex. How are you, sir? Your mic's off, Alex. Well, no, oh, there you are. I am doing pretty all right here at my home studio, which cons- consists of my own desk, and I've got my huge screen, and I've got my my smaller screen, which has the the show going, making sure that I look pretty pretty good with this. Uh, you look uh, you look the frozen, show. but you know we're Alex, we're making sure Alex, that you know, be safe and be uh, COVID friendly. You're frozen, Alex. Oh, now you're good. Okay, you're back. Do you see me? Okay. Hi. You're like, I look We're good. And you're sitting there just Can like, Can you hear me? Do you see me? Yes, we see you. I realize that I'm about a hey, half second behind you. That split second where I'm frozen, I still got to look good. Well, you looked good, all right. You looked but no, I'm doing pretty all right. Did. Pretty all right. So, Alex, we you saw a little bit of that interview we had with Digit Murphy, and let's let's kind of go on that here because I'm not saying this is a full scale women's hockey centric <laughs> program here, but let's talk about it because it is a sport that we do talk Should about. Should be. It is. We do we do talk about it a little bit because I remember. Was that a month that we kept talking about NWHL versus CWHL and the Women's National Hockey League that needs to come around? We were talking about that for a good two months after last after the 2019 playoffs. I remember that because it is a very important. I mean, it's a it's a rising sport and it deserves to be talked about. Yeah, you do have a good point there. And uh, once again, we have to we have to thank uh, good old Digit for having 
um, the time to spend on the show with obviously you. We weren't we were not able to have me on the show as well as you answer you know asking all the questions and all whatnot. But um, you know we, we look at how you would not have been able to get a word in. Now, CWHL, let's be you would not have been able to get a word in. You're you're right. You know we you know the the time that we did have was not enough. You know I would most certainly be happy to have her on for an entire episode of just talking women's hockey especially with um the guests that you have later on in the show um that'll but be, you know we that'll be something talk about the, the, the fall of the now, cwhl and how everything went down with that yeah so we, we talked about the the cwhl and how that fell and we talked about how the nwhl has became you know the the premier league for women's hockey just as it is it's the one show in town um, even though that doesn't really apply to us in Michigan, but as far as North America, that's really the one thing that's been um, women hockey outside of the international realm. But you know, when you when you're listening to to Digit speak and you're talking about how everything's going with the league currently, how everything is starting to you know progress in the as as far as the sport of women's hockey, everything's promising and everything's pointing north, right? Everything is it's showing a lot of promise and and we we are as not only us as members of the hockey community slash media, whatever you want to call it, um, as well as just being fans, uh, you know, we're trying to do our best to support the the game. And I think that's something that a lot of um, people in the hockey community are sort of getting around to there. COVID has been able to allow people to experiment more with what they do with their time. So when it comes to watching sports. Um, a lot of people had to adapt to watching hockey, playoff hockey, where there were six games in a day. And when we didn't have that, we were like, damn, we just got used to this and now it's gone. Now we're taking it away. So I think this is going to be a perfect time, um, you know, when everything opens back up for them and whenever, whenever they are able to get games on the ice, this is going to be a huge opportunity for them to really push into this market that's, normally been saturated by minor league hockey slash junior hockey slash college hockey slash professional hockey with the NHL. There's so many different avenues for hockey fans to watch um, at this high tiered level with this amount of skill. And I think that this is just going to add another option for fans to really watch some, some good quality game. Yeah. And then, like I said, that's going to be on their Twitch streams, which I believe they're still going to do again this year. They have two Twitch streams. They've got, like I said, the one tonight and in WHL open ice, which begins in 15 minutes. But I mean, you know, you guys can stay here if you want. You can watch that later. Well, of course, then again, Alex, I forgot to mention, they can watch this on the Jewel Show YouTube channel, watch the replay and listen to it. Forgot to mention that earlier. Make sure you can listen to it on your favorite podcatcher, Spotify and Google Podcasts, App Podcasts, SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Radio.com your other bootleg podcast site that you can find online. I'm pretty sure on that as well. Listen.fm. I mean, it's, it's crazy, Alex. We're like everywhere, but like nowhere at the same time, if that makes sense. But anyways, back to the conversation here. I, cause I broadcast women's hockey at Davenport. I've called games. I've called games on the road. I've called games and and I'll be honest with you. It's, it quite hasn't taken off at Davenport, but then you go to like, Adrian, which has an NCAA program, and so they got the money going in towards it, and you see the talent that they're able to bring in. Yeah, they're not winning national championships every year, but they're still a competitive team, and it's still something that the students like to go to. The two NCAA teams out there, but then again, they have like seven out there with their ACHA teams, but I digress. You like to see the fact that the game is growing. It's just not going to, it's not growing everywhere, and that's and that's the part that we're trying to you know push forward, and that's why I'm glad because Alex, you know how I was for a long time. I was, we need to have a WNHL. The NWHL needs to fold, and we'll just collaborate together and make it make it so. I've kind of, my mind's changed on that a lot, obviously. I'm full support of having a team in Toronto. <coughs> Dang it. I was, I was expecting that, that hair in my throat to go away. But I'm hoping now this league continues on, because I, now that, obviously, money is just going to be tight everywhere for the next couple of years, I'm hoping that they're able to move forward with this with no problem. They're able to go forward, and now the NWHL can kind of flourish a little bit, and maybe that can turn into something later on down the line. Because obviously, we always talk about Rome's not built in a day, and there's not going to be a fully functional professional women's hockey league in you know by tomorrow. It's a process, and that's why I like the thing that Digit said. She said how it's going to be a 
mar- it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's not, we need the league now. It's let's work up towards it because obviously you're going to want more than seven teams to have a professional hockey league. This is not the original six era. This is not 1950 where only six cities in the United, in the North Americas could, could house a hockey team. But I like the the idea what they're going with. And that's why I, see, I like to see the passion that Digit has because she's been in both leagues, Alex. She's coached with Boston, the Boston Blades, excuse me, in the CWHL. Now she's been here with Toronto. She sees the differences, and she still thinks that one can work. I mean, both worked in their own retrospects, but how the NWHL can still work. That should be a telltale sign for everyone to see, hey, this can this let's still promote this league. Let's still get behind women's hockey. And yes, the professional women's hockey league or the hockey association, excuse me, the player association, we can still cheer for that as well. The dream gap tour, because that is obviously a going for a different path as well, because they want to continue to grow in their respect. And eventually I'm hoping Alex, that we're just kind of doing like the swerve thing, like the CWHL and WHL come together, they go apart and let's hope they come back together. Cause obviously that big sponsorship that the, Women's Players Association got pulled in with the secret, the deodorant brand, a million dollars, which is unheard of for the sport. Now they're going to come back around, and you're going to have the continuing development of the media and the digitalized age of the NWHL come together. We may be looking at something, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, Alex. We may be looking at something in a few years here that could really kickstart a fully functional professional hockey league for women's hockey. Well, well, you look at that, and you have to think, Take everything that you just said and segmentalize it. So let's let's talk about women's hockey at the collegiate level. You mentioned that Adrian is with their NCAA women's program. That is something that is a viable option for students to watch. That's a viable option compared to Davenport, where you have a team with maybe 11 players. 12, 12, as far as I know, 12. Never. Okay, 12. 12 this year, maybe. Um, very rarely will they ever win a game. And not to mention, already, even with the, the D1 men's program, there's very few people that actually attend the games. It's it's not the greatest experience as far as, far as a fan in a cold rink with, with you know, terrible seating. You're, when you're housed at a community rink, you're going to get what you pay for. So as a fan, that's what that's one thing that you have to look at. There's there's obviously a complete difference within the facilities and how you actually want to watch the game. So that's one part. Then you go into how you know this isn't the original six era of the NHL. And and but you also have to think this is what this league is. This league is in its dormancy, it's or its infancy, and it has all the advantages that the original six of the NHL didn't have. They have all of these spread out markets across North America that have been probed with professional sports, whether it be basketball, men's ice hockey, uh, you know, Alex, pause that professional lacrosse, you know, whatever, any sport you want to take, it's been probed with that. that Hey, are you, are you on your grandmother's Wi-Fi? (laughs) There you are. Because you stopped once again. I am on my grandmother's Wi-Fi. That's probably why, because you froze for a good 20 seconds. It sounded good. But boy, this hey. sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies that I don't get to have I don't get to have a Ethernet cable hooked up into my laptop. And I'm I'm no, doing this, this off my bad. phone because I can't and I, I'm doing this off my phone instead of my laptop because my laptop's not being you know, compa- it's not working with Google, whatever. Okay. But anyways, so yes, I'm I apologize for looking like Sully from Monsters Inc. for a hot second, but it's fine. It's okay. You're getting the point across. Yeah, you're uh, really but as I was going, you you have these different professional. <laughs> you have these different markets that have been, you know, just probed with different sports and on the professional level. I mean, think about it. Before the Vegas Golden Knights came, and before the Raiders moved to Vegas, the only professional sport in town was the WNBA. Yep. And you look at that, and you think. Wow, look at that fan base. They had sold out crowds. They had capacity crowds on a regular basis because that was the only show in town. So you have to think, yes, there are so many areas for this kind of sport to flourish and so many areas where women's hockey could flourish. But to the same token, you also have to think what works traditionally. So 
is it a viable option for this a women's hockey league to go down to Vegas automatically right away? No, for one, it's a huge thing with travel. It's going to take a lot of money to do that. And two, you're having more and more teams and more and more stuff going on in the area. So now it's being like, all right, well, now we have a new show in town. Great. Now we have another new show in town. And it's kind of like the, the Vegas mentality of, all right, who's who's uh, at you know MGM Plaza this week? That kind of thing. Yeah. So I think – Women's hockey has this great opportunity to take advantage of stuff like Twitch TV, social media, and do and using all of these different resources that aren't traditional to the world of sport, or they're kind of, you know, they're starting to get into the stride, but there's so much opportunity. And I, I don't even care if I say that word 50 times in a row. That's that's honestly the most promising part of the NWHL and the growth of women's hockey. Right. And that's why I'm excited for our guest later on, Melody Dau coming on. She's a member of the Pro Women's Players Hockey or Hockey Players Association because obviously differing views, but I like to get both views because hey Alex, you know, we live we live in the United States. It's good to have two differing opinions and just to hear both sides of the story, right? Especially during these wonderful times. Isn't it fun? Right. Well, well, you're you're right. I mean, I mean, obviously you have your your own um your main job that you work and so you have a lot of delving with that but here's the thing there's a reason why there are two sides of the story there's a reason why there's two different methodologies and the fact that we have not just one front pushing for this cause for this movement of women's hockey makes it just that much stronger you you're gonna be looking at the best of both worlds whether or not they're completely combined or they're just standing next to each other, it's going to provide positives for each for each other because the NWHL could look at you know what the PWHPA that's right PWHPA yep. Pro Women's Hockey Players Yep, you got it right. Yep, you got it right. PWHPA and say, well, I think that I'm going. to to take this part that I like, this part that I like, and that one. And then you know, on the other side, you know, oh, I like that, I like that. Each side is like a kid in the candy store because they only have to do half of the work to get all of the benefit from it. So well, I think not on, on a personal one, I, I think that it's saying. great that we have two, but saying. if we could push for you, there, if there was one league, great, but you have to take advantage of the two-sided perspective that we have right now. Right. And that's why I like, just like I said, we like the fact that we have both. And I, I like the fact that on our show, yes, and I made sure they were on very opposite ends of the show to make sure that we didn't have any crossover because that would have been incredibly interesting because if you want, listen, we already got to watch two debates this year. We don't need any more of that here in the United States. But I, I like the fact that, there is a league that, because here's the thing, the NWHL could have followed suit. That's what I, that's what I wanted, Alex, and at first, I'm like, hey, maybe that'll force the, ND, the NHL's hand into there. They're going to be able to work together, and they're going to create a fully functional league at that time. Now, obviously, Alex, we're looking at a scenario where, wow, money's tight. The NHL is going to, I mean, their NHL is losing money by the day. We'll get to that a little bit later on, but they're not going to be able to, you know, to fund a league, fund a whole brand new league despite you know maybe the less you know the less cost to run a league more cost efficient ways to run that league regardless it's going to, it's not possible during these times so now you still have the pwhpa pushing along the nwhl is looking to come back and play their season and it's seeming like knock on wood everything is going to go back to somewhat of a, no, a new normal alex but a normal nonetheless and yes we see it like in college hockey where Games are getting canceled, rescheduled. Teams are playing different teams every single weekend just to try to make sure they can fit a schedule. And that may be the case for the NWHL. Same thing with the NHL. Same thing with the American Hockey League. Same thing with any hockey league in the world, any sports league in the world. Well, except for NFL. They just say, we'll just play it later. Just later on, we'll just play it later. We'll figure it out then because we can't just throw teams together because that would be dumb. But anyways, I, I want this game to flourish because I just want more. I like more. I like more hockey. I like watching hockey. I don't care. It, Alex, right now, I could call a peewee game at 6 a.m. at Griff's Ice House in the, in the, on the practice sheet. I wouldn't care. I'd be calling a game. And the fact that there is right now a movement, 
that is going towards that at right now is at its peak. And Alex, knock on wood, cross my heart, hope to die. I don't think it's at its last peak yet. It may be taking a little bit of a dip right now, but hey, every mountain's got its ridges. They may climb right back up even higher if this continues to push on. And this is coming from both sides of the spectrum, the NWHL and the Dream Gap Tour. And like I said, I'm hoping that eventually they come back around and they say, hey, we have the money side coming in. We got the sponsors coming in and they're willing to accept this new league, which is working its butt off to just try to make sure that they are relevant in the digital world, all the social media work they're doing, the streaming they're doing, all that work that they're going to build together, if they can put all their minds together, holy cow, Alex, all of a sudden, you have, without the help of a different entity, a possible, knock on wood, fully functioning league. And that's, and, you know, I'm glad that I can say that now because 2019, we're sitting there, the NHL's got to do something. Elliot Friedman said it. Gary Bettman's got to do something about it. But now... With the resource being put in on both sides. Now, I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying come Christmas Day, there's going to be a massive release. NWHL and Pro Women's Hockey Players Association are going to combine forces for the 2020-21 season. That's not going to happen. I'm sorry. I wish I could be the king of wishful thinking that way, but that's not going to be the case in this scenario. But down the line, if we just continue to push forward and see, like, all right, let's continue to build and build. Because guess what, Alex? You can quickly build a house out of sticks and hey, but guess what? The third little pig that built it on bricks slowly and took his time, that one stood up to the big bad wolf. Holy cow, where'd that analogy come from? Who fed that on the reader? That was awesome. <laughs> Alex, Al Alex, you there? Alex? Yeah, I'm here. You, you just keep cutting out a lot. Oh, I keep cutting out a lot? Am I, jump in the chat, am I, or am I cutting out on yeah. your end? Because... It, sound, it looks like I'm good on my end, but long story short, Alex, it's a marathon, not a sprint. I'm, I like it might, games. It, it might be my Wi-Fi. Well, you don't have a, don't you have a limited data? Yeah, no, I, 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 I can. Well, it, even if I, even if I didn't use, even if I didn't use Wi-Fi, I'm still in a black spot when it comes to data. So either way, I'm kind of screwed. That's true. Well, there you, is, you, there. you understand this. We, we did, we did this, we did the show. For however long, and whenever we were done with the show, we had to, you know, we uploaded the podcast or whatever. If it was the the show where we actually had video, it took forever to upload because that's just how where it is right, like where we are. We're just in this dark spot. Yeah. So obviously, you have better than I do, but who cares? No, this yeah. this is what we have to do. This is the new normal. I only had to stuck the light. I only used to have to stick my laptop back when we did the QL podcast videos, which took literally. 15 hours on that stinking wife. I do it here now. It, it, the video is up in about, oh, you know, maybe a, maybe an hour, maybe 40 minutes. It's all good. And these are short. These are longer videos that we were doing then. I really had to put it next to the Wi-Fi box. Thank goodness for a comp Can I say the company? I don't know if I can say the company on here. I say coffee brands. I don't know if I can say the coffee. But anyways, regardless, I like where women's hockey is heading. I mean, I'm sure you could say the company. They're just not a sponsor. Xfinity. Hey, I can say it. But I, I am really glad that I'm. First, I'm glad that Digit Murphy took the time, you know. And I can't wait to talk to Melly Daou, which will cap off our show. That's coming up in an hour. Well, the last half hour of the show, of the eight o'clock hour, we'll have Melly Daou, Team Canada member as well, two-time Olympian. She'll be coming on here. Well, Alex, let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the NHL and possibly asking players for more money. There's a lot of whispers going on about that because the league is starting to realize that, hey, we're it's going to be a little bit tougher to have a season than we thought. So we'll talk about that and more when we come back here on the Cule Show here on 12 Ounce Sports. We'll be back right after this. I actually had hit the play button for the music. <laughs>
Drink Aid, ready for distribution worldwide. And welcome back, everyone, to the Kuehl Show here on 12 Ounce Sports. Tyler Kuehl here, the inside of the insiders. Alex Kuehl over there making all the chip noises in the background. So if you guys want to know what he's eating. What he's chip noises? I'm not eating. I was hearing some. I heard some crackling. Uh, by the way, uh, apparently the Badgers, according to the Twitter feed, Wisconsin is playing well right now against the who they were playing. Penn State. Wisconsin's going to be good this Great. year. Wisconsin's, Wisconsin's going to be good this year. I think a lot of people are going to be surprised by them. So, so Alex, we one thing we forgot to mention on that first on that first half hour of having you on, or first, yeah, I wrote it down for you. You didn't, you didn't talk about it. Well, there's so much other news because I was going to mention how we're talking about how women's sports right now is flourishing so much. We're talking about Kim Ng, of course, being hired a couple of weeks ago by the Miami Marlins, the first female GM in all, any major professional sport. Today, the news coming out, Kendall Coyne Schofield becoming part of the player development for the Chicago Blackhawks, a similar position that Haley Wickenheiser held with the Toronto Maple Leafs up until, I believe, this year because she's doing so much with the COVID uh, fight up in Canada. So it's great news for her because Kendall Coyne, obviously a great broadcaster. She was really gaining her chops, too, this year. She's doing a few games for NBC, doing Notre Dame hockey games. But I like, you know, I like, the, I like the move because she wants to become a general manager, and that's a good place to start. You're going to be under a general manager that, yes, at times looks like a loony, but at times we've seen he, I mean, he built a dynasty in the cap era, Alex, and Stan Bowman. So if you're going to learn, learn from a guy that's won in Kendall Coyne Schofield. She's definitely getting the right spot right there with going now to the Blackhawks and going to be learning from Stan Bowman. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, nothing? Nothing on that one? I'm not- I, I, I mean, you, you said everything I was going to say. I mean, I I will have to say congratulations to uh, to uh, Kendall for getting the opportunity to, to and having this position. It's obviously a great thing for women in hockey to have more opportunities. Kind of makes my uh, my career plans a little bit a uh, little bit worse because I I, I made the joke uh, to a couple of my friends who are also in sports management at Davenport University, and I said, man, you know. With with all these all these you know you know blazers that are just coming in you know women in professional sports that are getting these higher up office positions and you know being general managers or you know being directors of player development or even having these kind of positions kind of really puts more people into the in the job market which makes you know the likelihood of us getting a job a little bit down but now I make it as a joke and this is this is all. You know, everyone deserves an opportunity, regardless of who you are, you know, race, gender, all that kind of stuff. You know, I, I'm just I'm really proud of uh, or not necessarily proud because I have no personal connection, but really happy to see that she got the opportunity and being able to be a part of that organization, which she said as a local, she's been wanting to be a part of um, since she was a kid. And I, and I do say this, Alex, in the nice way possible. Sometimes we on this show joke about, and I joke, and I give you flack about your skiing sometimes, but this is going to be straight up honest. Alex, Kendall Coyne can outskate you by a mile and a half. I love you, Alex. But... Oh, I know it. <laughs> but... She can, she could kill both of us. Take See, that's why I'm a my goaltender. Skill I don't have to skate. As I'm a, a hockey player. Take my skill plus your skill. Still nowhere near. We are not a breath of hot air in the winter compared to her. We are, yeah, because we, we breathe yeah. the air, and she just skates right through it like it's nothing. I mean, she, I, I can't wait to see what's going to happen. It's kind of like she's an Olympian. Well, something she's like, like that. She's I don't like know. a premier top-tier athlete. That's what Kendall Coins Gofield is. So can't wait to see what kind of stuff she does out of there in Chicago. Great news coming out of the Sunshine State. Alex, we're talking about you know barriers being broken. How about this? Brett Peterson the first ever black assistant general manager 
in the National Hockey League. He's going to be working under Bill Zito down there with the Florida Panthers. That news coming out this past week. Brett Peterson, which I found out because I didn't know it actually existed. He's one of those guys that kind of just showed up and then went away. Played for the Griffins, apparently. Didn't know that. But congratulations to him because now he is a guy that has an opportunity to really make his way up through the general manager ranks and uh, working behind a guy like Bill Zito. And I think, you know, in terms of Florida's case, Alex, this is going to be very similar to Yarmo Kekalainen mentoring Bill Zito. Bill Zito was working under Kekalainen for the last few years in Columbus. Now Zito gets an opportunity. Hopefully it works out, obviously, because obviously you want to have Peterson to have a great mentor in Zito and just kind of have the chain reaction. So this is a great move for Florida, giving a guy like Peterson an opportunity, a guy that's worked as a sports agent. So he knows how to work with athletes, work with players, and he worked with a couple of bigger names as well. I think I forgot which... Which, uh, which agency, which player he had for his agency. He works for Wasserman Media Group and based out of Los Angeles. Had a couple of big names go through there. Actually played on the 2001 Boston College National Championship team, Alex. The team that broke the, I believe it was the 49-year drought they, they had won or 50-year. No, 50. They won in 52 Oh, it was a long time, Boston College, between championships. I remember that. Now they seems like they're always in the hunt all the time now. He was on that team, played a lot in the ECHL. Not I as like, long as not as long as the Leafs, though. It was not as long as the Leafs because, yeah, because obviously the Leafs won the cup after Boston College won that 1950. I swear it's 1952 because Michigan won in 48, Dartmouth won in 49, and then no, Dartmouth didn't win in 49. Boston College won in 49. It was it was 52 years. Okay, so anyways. I got my numbers right now, 52 years for Boston College. So congratulations to Peterson. Alex, I like it because, once again, we're talking about how women's hockey is getting growth, and we're talking about all the work that was done for the Black Lives Matter. We skate for Black Lives that the NHL was doing during the playoffs, and now you're seeing the league and teams in this league take it seriously with a move like this, bringing a guy that is around the game. It's not like this guy has just been brought out of the blue just because of the fact. This guy has actually been around hockey. He knows the game. He played the game. He's got the mind of a player. He can really help maybe this Florida team really kind of flourish in an assistant GM role and hopefully make his way up to possibly becoming a National Hockey League general manager. Well, the, the two things that really stick out to me um, in in this scenario and are, are the fact that, for one, he has the playing experience. He knows what it's like to be a professional ice hockey player. Two, as a previous agent with a couple bigger names that he has uh in that he had worked with he is he knows the mindset of the other side and i think in especially today's game in today's game the one thing that a lot of general managers don't necessarily possess is that cunning you know kill 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 mentality that sports agents do because agents what is their job it is to make the lives of their client better that's their job so what what it doesn't matter what they do they're going to do everything that they possibly can down to throwing out the kitchen sink to make sure that their players are taken care of and making sure that they have the opportunity you know the money the sponsorships you know ad revenue whatever whatever is in the contract they get it. so i think to be able to have you know, Brett Peterson have that kind of background and to be able to have that knowledge of the other side, it kind of gives him a credibility that other general managers don't, especially especially as someone who, like I said, has experience in playing the game, has experience on the other side, and also is kind of unknown in this realm. So, you know, bringing in a guy like, you know, Kyle Dubas for Toronto – all he had to his name was the fact that he worked with the Marlies and they won a couple of championships as a de- a development feeder to the Leafs. Yeah. Which yes, it gives you some credibility, but it's 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 nothing like true experience. And that's why when Dubis came on, you know, you had you know Lamorello that was there to help him and Shanahan that could help him, but that doesn't necessarily provide him the perfect opportunity or at least the credibility to be able to negotiate these contracts. And honestly, I think that's a huge reason why he had such problems with Marner and Nylander being the two big ones that he had to fight through and really had such a problem with in, within his first two years 
as general manager of the Leafs. I think this is a great opportunity. And like you said, he's got uh, a great mentor for him down in the Sunshine State, and I think he's uh, I think he's in a good position. I I want to see. I, well, then again, Alex, you all, you know me. I Florida is my dark horse every year until that franchise burns into the ground and no one else shows up to a game for the rest of their livelihood. I'm going to say Florida is my dark horse. And now the sweaters are there, the the reverse retros. Now I have to cheer for them for sure, but because they have the potential. And I wonder, you know, Peterson, is it year one going to be, Hey, just focus on Springfield, focus on the American league team, similar to what Dubas did with the Marlies. Cause that's typically how it's been going. Cause Teams in the American Hockey League don't have a specific guy running the team. Not like back in the day in Grand Rapids, we had Bob McNamara for, I think it was a decade and a half. But it's not that case anymore. It's typically just the assistant GM. Hey, can you make sure the AHL team we develop well down there? Maybe some of the ECHL guys. That's typically what it's been for the last few years. And that's probably what's going to be looked upon for Brett Peterson. Hey, if you can make sure we can get the right development down there, get the right staff down there, hey, then obviously we're on the right path. Because it's not like Brett Peterson just sits in Bill Zito's office or, I mean, look at down in Dallas, Jim Nill. He didn't just sit there and watch, you know, Ken Holland day to day. He didn't sit there and just shadow him. He was doing some work. He was obviously taking a lot of notes. He had a good hand. Even when McNamara was the GM for the Grand Rapids Griffins, he, Jim Nill, had a real big part for the Grand Rapids development, which, yes, at times was a little funny, a little flaky, but he was able to use his tools that he learned in Detroit to become a GM in Dallas. And, uh, by the way, Alex, if you haven't heard, Dallas almost won the darn thing this year, almost you know two wins away from it. So there is potential for Brett Peterson. I can't wait to see how he goes from here. Now, moving on, Alex, we have a couple of things we're going to try to get to. Uh, we talk about concussions, possibly if we have time today. We got to talk about the important thing, though, Alex. Braden Holt being his tortoises. How'd they get across the border? Thank God that he did. Let's just let's just be happy about that because you can't forget your. Is it? It'd be tortoises, not tortoise eye. Can't forget your tortoise. Can't forget your turtles, Alex. I don't know. That wasn't the big story, but I just thought that was a very peculiar story. That hey, a guy that is Canadian who is played on the Olympic team, played on your World Cup of Hockey team. Actually, was he on the Olympic team? I don't know. He wasn't on the uh, I don't remember now. He was on your World Cup of Hockey team. He is Canadian. Why can't he bring his turtles across the border? What in the world? Uh, Because, no. Do they need it? I don't know. Do tortoises need rabies pe- shots? If people aren't. If people aren't allowed to bring their dogs or their cats over, do you think a guy is going to be allowed to bring his turtles? Absolutely not. Okay, well, you know, I'm just glad they got up there. Everyone's safe now. They're in Vancouver. They're in lockdown. They're waiting for the season to start. And because obviously players are moving back to their stage where they're supposed to play because Miko Letton and Alex, if you heard, they, they terminated his contract with Yoker Yoker right in the KHL, the Finnish team, because he's trying to come back to Toronto so he can get ready. So maybe training camp's on the way. However... In order for us to begin a season, we need to talk about cash, Alex. Cash, money. We need to talk about the NHL asking for more money out of the players, getting a big differential than that was already agreed upon upon the CBA that was negotiated for the next few seasons. The alteration of the CBA, which was extended until 2026, and now here we are. The league is asking for more money. I, You know, at first glance, Alex, you think, oh, cripes. The league did so well with COVID, they were able, how they were able to handle it. They did so well on making sure that they could make sure everyone was safe, good, and they can complete the Stanley Cup. Gary Bettman's a great guy. And now the league's just going to ruin it all by asking for more money from the players. Now, I don't want this to become a scenario of how Major League Baseball had the big, fat problem of how much money they were going to lose. Then again, they don't have a salary cap in baseball, so I don't that, that's in its own realm. But the National Hockey League here for me, Alex, is that Major League Baseball didn't have a set number defined in advance. The NHL has had that already. They did that before the playoffs, before they all went into bubbles. Now they want more money taken out because, yes, it's going to be a little bit more expensive to try to run the league now. You're gonna, they're obviously looking at possible bubbles to start the year in each division, possibly. That is, I mean, it's not set into stone yet, but it seemed like there's going to be a Canadian division. There's going to be less travel across the board. However, obviously the league is continuing to lose money as it's not playing on time. And obviously the season's going to be shorter, which means less TV revenue money, even though there's going to be the playoffs, a, what seems to be a full-scale playoffs. The National Hockey League is asking for more. 
The NHLPA, they did agreed on a 10% salary deferral. Now they're looking at an additional, according to Larry Brooks of the New York Post, Brooksy, an additional 13%. Not just adding 3%, Alex. We're talking 23% in total. Almost a quarter of player salaries. Now, yes, I know these guys that even make 700 grand, they're making more than all of us. I get that. And you can go on that whole schmeal if you want. But let's look at it from the player side, Alex. You already agreed upon with your boss, the NHL, per se, the, and the NHLPA. They all came together. They all shook hands and said, all right, 10% over the next three, or this year and maybe next year, the season after. Fine by us. We'll get it back later on. Perfect. Great. Even if the league, Alex, pays back this 23% over the years as it becomes more financially stable once again, that's still a chunk of change, Alex, that these guys, why would they want to give it up if they've already agreed upon something prior? Well, I I see the point of view to the player. I, I do. I, I understand that, you know, if I was making, you know, that kind of that kind of money, I'd be wanting to have it. You know, if you for a lot of these players like Holtby and, you know, others that you have to you have to end up moving to a brand new city and, and in that case a different country, you wanna be able to have that amount of financial stability and when you're taking away you know just around a quarter of your salary and you're just not getting it you're kind of like how taxes are withheld and that kind of stuff you 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 do have it it, it's more of a, a sense of unease and i think that's a lot of the reason why players are having such a huge problem with this um so like you said, it is an additional 13% on top of the previously agreed on 10% um, that the CBA did instill. Um, but from the league side of things, these teams are going to be rough when it comes to operating budgets. And this is going to be something that when it comes to looking at players – Yes, players are not going to be getting 23% of their paycheck, you know, however whatever the installments are. But to the same token, do you would have players that are making $700,000, 1 million, 2 million, you know, $10 million contracts not having 23%? Or would you rather have organizations lay off people that are making, you know, 25000 thirty thousand dollars a year because that's that's what's going to end up happening is because these 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 leagues and and i I talk about leagues as in not just the nhl but when we focus on the nhl there are teams that have the they have not released which teams but there is a collection a small collection of nhl teams that have expressed concern to the league that they are going to be running the red if they operate this season. Now, Alex, and, your, and your I point think there, that's going to be a huge thing. That, that's a, there a, a there big... are teams that run in the red before this season as well. Florida being one, Arizona starting to get better, but there are teams that run in the red, but you're talking about teams well, that right, run even right. deeper into the red. In... Well, right. You know, no, you know, Florida and, and, and Arizona slash Phoenix, well, obviously Phoenix before they became Arizona, those teams already run a line of debt. And that's a, a huge thing, and the league tries their very best to help out with that, you know, taking money that they put aside specifically for this case and th- this these kind of scenarios. But that bank is going to run dry really quickly because there are now this new collection of teams that are now going to be running the red if they operate. And that's, that's, a hu- that's the huge reason why the NHL is like, okay, I know this is really bad, but it's it's essentially asking the NHLPA and the players as a collective, can we get a loan? We, if we want to operate how we need to to be successful and to keep this game and this league relevant, we need this budget. We're asking for a loan, and if the NHLPA doesn't want to give it, then I'm I'm sorry, but the league and its teams are going to suffer. The, the players are not, obviously, and you know what? They might have their own little thing where we might have a, a lockout by owners just purely on the basis of the, they're not safe. 
or they're not comfortable with operating under these kind of circumstances. But that's just how it's going to be. I think that in this in this scenario, I I feel for the players, but give a give your friends some money. You know, give 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 Grandpa some money so that way he can he can live a little bit easier this year, and then let him pay you back a little bit later on. Right, because currently the uh, the aforementioned ten percent agreement that was initially inst- instilled into the CBA, the extension of the CBA through twenty twenty six, there the players are going to get repaid from twenty twenty two through twenty twenty four. That ten percent was going to get paid back. Now, obviously, that could still be the case if it's agreed upon that this twenty three percent does get taken out, because obviously you just pay it back in bigger increments, or you can pay it through the remainder of the CBA, extend it all the way to 2026, make it a little bit longer so the league doesn't have to pay in such lump sums in those three years. Now, I believe, because here's the thing, yes, that the rumors are starting to swirl, and yes, there is the, at right now, knock on what a minute possibility, it may grow, but there is a possibility that, yes, Alex, we may look at the possibility that the NHL just says, oh, screw it, we're not even going to play this year. I just threw my little phone piece I've been fidgeting with all show. Darn it, it's gone now. But I, I you don't want it to happen. But well, it's, it's not a rumor. It's 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 part near an established fact. No, it's not a and fact. That's, that's and that's the no, problem. Alex, and that, that's and one thing that Alex, a fact would be the league is not going to play. No, no it's, it's a, a very likely. It's a very likely possibility. It's no longer a rumor. It is. So it's a actual situation we have to face. And I get it, that. It's, it's not. It's not a. You know what? Well, I mean, it might. It might happen. And no, no. It. It. This is. It's going to happen if X, Y, and Z do not go through. It does. It's starting to build up. It is starting to build up. That's what I'm trying to say. And it is. It is terrifying because they're not going to start. I, I. Realistically, you cannot start in February and not play only 45 games. Because you don't want, like when we talk about with not just the fact of having Seattle start on time, you don't want to get in this habit of, oh man, we got to wait now because the players got to rest up because we went all the way into August again. You want to just be like, all right, let's get it done by mid to late June, get it done before Canada Day. We keep free agency on track, we keep draft sort of on track, and then we go back to normal for the 2021 2022 season. That should be the plan that the NHL is thinking about. If it gets to the point, where they cannot agree upon a deferral number. And I don't know if we look at the NHL, the players being agreed. Obviously, if the league comes back down and say, hey, 15%, then and I think that's where the players have to accept it. Now, obviously, the discussions are there. The league is asking right now for 23%. If the league brings it down to what it seems to be more fair number percentage for the players, then I believe then, yes, you can look at the players. Because right now, the NHL... Even though I see it, I understand it. Why the league's asking for more money? However, you made your bed, and you have to lie in it right now. And I'm not saying you don't have the league operating in the red because that may affect the league in the future, unless something can happen down the line of some compromise. Well, is, well, oh, a great okay. We so you, you, yeah, you have to you have to lie in the bed that you 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 say that. Well, you have to lie in the bed. You have to lie in the bed that you made for yourself. Sure, okay. But there's not going to be a bed to lie in or lay in if you don't have this. There's a reason why the NHL is asking for this. They're not just doing it for, you know, you know, lollipops and Tootsie Rolls. No, they're doing it because they need it. They need this to operate. I, I know. I'm, I'm going crazy. I'm, I'm trying not to swear, Tyler. I'm trying not to swear. FCC. Because this, I, FCC I, I, to, I've looked at this. I've, we got we – got, Dad and Colleen watching. We don't want to. We don't want to have them get mad at us for dropping. And they're fine. No, they've they fine. It's a four-letter word. But no, I've I've seen. (laughs) Yes, it's a four-letter word. Starts with that. But no, I've seen the Sportsnet article. I've looked at TSN. I've listened to, you know, a couple other podcasts that have talked about this and different media outlets, what have you. And the one thing that I keep thinking about is why? Why would the league ask for this? Where, where's the cynicism? Where's the, okay, but now we're going to screw you over? I, I don't see it. I don't hear it anywhere. I don't hear it from independent sources. I don't hear it from league insiders. I don't hear it from hockey media insiders. 
there's no cynicism in this. This is the league basically just saying our hands have been cut open. We need bandages. We're going to bleed out if you give us bandages. So, yes, I think that whether it's maybe it's going to 20%, you know, maybe not the full 23, but 20% is a, is a viable option where it's 3% is a lot more than you think it is when it comes to money. So even just doing 20% and then getting at a little bit than expected for the league side of things that could work out. And then you take out the payment deferral or the payment plan going through the, the end of the current CBA I think that's a viable option. I think that the league is going to benefit from it because everyone's going through a rough patch right now. Right. And if these players want to have a season, I think they're going to have to sacrifice. And it's to hard extent, for me to though, say that's the, that's, that that's the somebody big else should have to sacrifice. Yeah, no, to what extent do you want to play? Do you, do you want to play? Do you want to play? I, I, I say paid? this. Do you want to get paid I say anything? I ask the same question when I talk about. I ask the same question when when players for teams when they're signing contracts. The one question that I asked when we were talking about the Nylander deals, when we were talking about the Marner deals, as we we're talking about Toronto, and you know, we're not Toronto, bit, but we we'd like to talk about Toronto a lot, okay? What the one thing that I kept I mean, I asking Mika was, Wetton, but... do you want to play? Right. I, I, I think. No, no, we've done a really good job. We've done a really good job. But we've done a really good job. And, and I've said, you know, do you want to play? So if these players, they want, if they want to play and they want to have a platform to play the sport that they love and, you know, to have this continued status of NHL hockey player, then they're going to have to pay a little bit. It, it's a rough time, and you've already seen a lot of people get laid off in different places for different reasons, but a, a big reason why people you know, in different industries are getting laid off and you know, trying to go towards more cost-effective ways of operating, it's because as of right now, we are in a state of I don't know. We, there's no certainty. Right. Because we, we've we've looked at every league right. that's that's currently in the off season and they say, Well, this is this you know, February is the date that we're coming back and then underline an asterisk there's this is a project, projected date given X, Y, and Z and how we're gonna be able to be able to play this out and how Dates safe and we're times keep are the players subject to change. Yeah. So Right. So how do you the league wants the same sanity that the players want. Players want the money because obviously when you have to travel, you know, or if you have to move a family or even just living the hockey lifestyle that a lot of these players do, where you, you pay your agent, you pay a personal training coach to take care of you during the off season and make sure that you're ready to go as soon as things get back to going. And even even during this, you're obviously doing like stuff like video calls for this kind of stuff. But and then having to invest in your playing career, yes, that's a lot of money. But both sides want to be comfortable when it comes to their bank account. But I think that the NHL has a bigger cause and a bigger ploy, for wanting or sh they should have this money. That's right. all I have to say about it. Right. And and I, you can you can say what you want about it, and the players can say what they want about it, but. The, you can't play in a league that's not operating. I, I, on that, I say, and I hope I, and then when I say this, it's going to sound, it's going to make the owners in the league sound really like really big fat jerks. But then again, we've been, uh, Alex, in, in our lifetime, you and I, we've been through two lockouts and we were looking at, we were staring a third right down to the wire. Thank goodness we didn't have to do that because listen, you think a pandemic was bad of how much crazy content we would have had. Imagine back then when we didn't have all this cool camera technology and guests coming on the show. It would have been just him and I yelling at each other. And that would have been the end of the show. But, no, I, I'm i hoping that the league with this 13 extra percent, making it 23 percent, I'm hoping this is one of those sell high and willing to negotiate down that they could probably operate efficiently on a 
17% deferral or a 20% deferral. Let's try 23% to make sure we can have some money to kind of hold us off for a little bit longer. That's the only thing I could possibly hope for, that that's the plan right here, and they're going to be willing to in the PA and the league to get together and have these conversations, you know, debates, whatever you want to call them, that eventually they bring it back down to a fair number that's fair enough for the players. And here's the thing. I was able to listen a little bit because if you guys follow TSN on on Instagram and Twitter, they have like these little kind of like cell phone, I guess, Instagram stories that are sports center updates. And Pierre LeBron on his phone said that if the league wants to start by January 1st, they need to figure out something by December 1st, which, Alex, if you looked at your little uh, little thing there, that's in eight days. So and yes, uh, that that's a that's going to come up pretty quick, Alex. So I don't know if that's a feasible opportunity. It may not be January 1st, but hey, for the sake of World Juniors conversation, let's have it go after the World Junior Tournament. Crazy idea, Alex. So then if you want to have Edmonton play in Edmonton, the Oilers play in their own rink, let the players clear out of the World Junior Tournament, and you have them move back in, play mid-January, play 50 games, 55 games, give, maybe give yourself some room so you can reschedule games and move them around, and boom, you're back to normal, hopefully by 21-22. That, I would hope, is the plan by the league. You, don't, or, uh, that, you got nothing? Nothing on that? Alex? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you must have just, like, cut out for a long, long time. Did I cut out? No, because you, you were just going, and then I just heard stop. Let, so. let, 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 let me know, guys, if I'm cutting out. It, it has to be my Wi-Fi. It's not your Wi-Fi. It, Don't you honestly, it has wifi. to be my Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi that you are operating on, Alex. That's That would be the proper lingo for the... <laughs> oh, whatever. Shut up. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. I Hey, listen. You don't want to pay for Wi-Fi. It's not fun, Alex. You don't want to pay for anything. Be as least of an adult as possible for as long as you can. Because when you become a full-scale adult, it gets ugly. <sighs> I don't know why I went to full-scale, you know, uh, boogeyman there. But anyways, so... Uh, we got about 25 odd minutes here, Alex, before we get to Melody Dau coming up in the last little section of our cool show here today on Monday, November the 23rd. By the way, hey guys, I, I'm just going to say this now because I know I'm going to forget when we have to wrap up the segment with Alex. Someone's got a birthday coming up. Someone's got a birthday. My baby brother's got a birthday. Turn a big old 22, Alex. Look at you, you old fart. Alex, anything? Anything? Hello? Hello, Alex? You, you cut out again, so, hi. You're having a birthday! All I heard was, happy birthday! Yeah! And I was like, mm, okay. Yeah, you're turning 20. Yeah, Alex turned 22 on Wednesday, so make sure you follow him at TheRealAlexQ on Instagram and fill his crap with, hey, happy birthday! Or if you can always do it now if you want. If you're watching the video, you can always just throw it in the comments. Say, hey, happy birthday, Alex, even though you may not watch till next week, which would be fine. He'll be 22 then. He'll be 22 on Wednesday. It's okay. Also, if you're listening, you can always comment. I think you can, well, you can comment on SoundCloud. I don't think you can comment on Spotify. Oh, Alex, he's gone. He ran away. Alex, help. Oh, oh no. No. I'm... He's there. He's back. Back again. Alex is back. Don't tell your friends. See what, see what I did okay. there? That was Eminem. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Trying to do. I'm trying to do the data thing. That way, everything works better. I'm trying to go on data. All right. Sweet. So maybe we'll see work. how it works. I don't uh, know. I'm glad you waited until the last, the, the last legs, the latter half of, the, of your of your appearance today. Oh, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> All right, Alex, I'll let you lead this last part here uh, before we go to break, or well, before we go to break, it's another 20 minutes. You put on, on, the, on our outline, something about concussions and how there's a lawsuit going on. Give us a little bit more on that, and let's discuss. Yes, Tyler, you know that I love talking about concussions and, you know, the whole human bullet effect, um, but this is, for, this is coming from Rick Westhead of TSN, Great guy, um, currently by the way. There is Great a... guy. Everyone should follow him. R, I think it's R Westhead TSN, I believe, on on Twitter. Uh, I believe so. Yes. Um, but there is a ongoing legal battle between the NHL and a number of I want to say, let's see, 
eight insurance companies um, that the NHL filed a lawsuit in New York State, which is where they're based out of, is their headquarters, um, that are refusing to pay most of the costs related to the league's year long or years and years long concussion lawsuit. Um, so this is a settlement that has been uh, reached between the league and retired players. So for those of you that don't know, there has been a movement of players that have previously played for the league that have been wanting um, basically damage pay for the multiple mental injuries, concussions that they've suffered Ooh. during their time playing. And now let's just be so, honest. Let's just say something. This has been going on for a while, but obviously there's more. There's an update right now is what Alex is going on here. Right. So um, in November, November uh, 2018, the league announced that there was an $18.9 million settlement uh, within the lawsuit, uh, which on the other side was a collection of thir- 318 uh, former players that dropped the lawsuit, accusing the league of downplaying the long term effects of repeated brain trauma. Um, this basically comes about to paying off lawyer fees and costs, uh, neurological tests for players, and up to $75,000 for medical treatments with cash payouts of $20,000 per player um, from the Common Good Fund to help retired players in need. Um, So the NHL alleged that the lawsuit, that in its lawsuit that for insurance coverage, it's going to have to date back to 1974 um, with settling the concussion litigation and going through all the different legal costs. So as it sits right now, this it's basically these companies are looking at the league and saying, well, we don't want to pay or help pay for that kind of money, even though the league and its teams, they have their insurance that they go out and, and they, you know, they cover everything that they need to. That way they can operate and still have stuff like body checking and literal fist fights on the ice and having covering themselves through all of these different types of situations where someone can get hurt, they can try to sue the league or the team or the opposing team. Because by the way, for those that you don't for those of you that don't know, before leagues and teams had this, if a player took a hockey stick and smacked it across the face of somebody else, two things could happen. One, the person that got smacked, if they were still conscious, could press charges for assault with a deadly weapon, or they could go, they could sue the team that they played for, sue the team that they played against, the player in question, and the league if they weren't covered. Because that's how it works. That's how the legal system works. If you do something bad, you're probably going to pay for it. So um, the so the NHL filed. This was on July 31st that they filed the initial lawsuit. And as of right now, it sits that uh, tens of millions of dollars in damages plus a nine percent interest um, for breach of the policies is owed to the league from these companies. So this is um, saying that, you know, the NHL has paid roughly $16,981,600 of the settlement to date. Um, but this is with the keeping in mind that the, the insurers have not reimbursed them for the payout. Right. And so I'm just doing my little bit of research here, Alex, because you talk about 1974 is when the league actually started to have actual – uh, insurance for the players and whatnot. Cause you talk about the suing a lot of it did spur from, and this is more or less just kind of an observation and of a historical matter. The infamous, uh, terrible Ted green and Wayne Mackey stick fight that happened during the 1969 preseason where Mackey hit green in the head so hard that he had brain injuries. And obviously, it, and he had to miss, I believe he said did not return and played, did not return to action or did return to action the following season, the 70, 71 season. But because back then there were there was no conscious for players. It was like, hey, I'll just go out and play. I'm fine. I'm good now. My brain's OK. My legs work. That's how it was back in those days. But that's when the, I think the league began to realize, all right, first of all, let's quit with the stick fighting Two, maybe we should actually insure these players so they don't sue us anymore, because that was a really big problem. And so 
it, it's just it's a it's good to see that the league took that step then. However, it's taken the league so long to realize, all right, now there's insurance, so we should be okay. But then, wow, these concussions, these are still a problem no matter what insurance is there. And, and I'm glad that, you know, these players are sta- they're stepping up and saying, hey, guys, let's, <clears throat> let's actually think about something. Here. Let's actually think about ourselves because, gosh, there's so many players. I mean, I look at a guy like Joe Murphy who is – I hope I, I since the story came out, I hope he's not homeless anymore, but he's a guy that was bum on the street because of injuries that led to his drug problems. And Kevin Stevens was another one, a great player for the Penguins back in their cup days in the early nineties, a guy that went into drug problems. They had to go to drug rehabilitation many times because of the fact that he had concussion issues. Keith Primo was the guy that's really led this because Keith Primo's career, Alex really got derailed because he was such a big star for that Flyers team. And, yes, I know he was a big guy with Detroit as well, but he really peaked with the Flyers, but concussions. And, shoot, why did it take Eric Lindros so long to get into the Hall of Fame, Alex? Because concussions and the way they were treated back in those days. Because he had multiple concussions. He had problems. He had a collapsed lung that kept him out for a long period of time. Now that the fact that the league is, I know the league just doesn't want to pay that amount of money, and I get that. You, you don't, you want to pay as little as possible, but the league has to pay up because for their lack of, I say their lack of care, but their lack of acknowledging a problem for so long. Because granted, yes, concussions, let's, do, let's be honest, let's be honest, Alex. Concussion, you know, concussion safety, concussion protocols, concussion research really wasn't done until the mid to late 80s when it really become a prevalent issue. And it was kind of hush-hush back in those days because, hey, you just got your ball on, rub some dirt on it. But now it's starting to – you see the effects. And, of course, you know, family members are Danny over there at Michigan. He's got a big thing over there with cancer research, but over there in Michigan as well, they have a lot of that concussion testing sort of stuff. They do a lot of that research over there because it's such an important problem that needs to be discussed. And that's why you see these lawsuits – and I don't know if the league can really back out of this one because, listen, these players well, that are fighting for it, they're going to keep going, Alex. They're going to keep arguing about it. They're going to want their money. They're going to want restitution. And to be honest, I, can, I see why, and I kind of have to agree with them, Alex. Well, here, here's the thing. It's not, this isn't a thing between the league and the players. Let's get that straight. It is league. It is the league and insurance companies. That's what it is. Right. And and you talk about, you know, the league has to pay it up. Well, they, they have. They are paying it up. They have gone out and they've, as you know, as of this was reported, they paid over just part near $17 million of an $18.9 million settlement. They're paying up. That's not the problem. It The problem is that these insurance companies that the league was able to work with um, let's you know, let's just name them TIG Insurance Co., Federal Insurance Co., Chubb Insurance Co. of Canada, National Union Fire Insurance Co. of Pittsburgh, Vigilant Insurance Co., American Home Assurance Co., Aviva Insurance Co. of Canada, and Zurich Insurance Co. Those eight that are involved in the lawsuit with the league are not paying back the league because how they were able to work it out with the deal is that the league would pay up for upfront costs with the insurance companies paying them back. Just like how you would pay, you know, upfront costs for certain medical things or like a car, you know, problem, whatever, and then the insurance company would pay you back. These companies are saying that they're not going to. And they're they're basically okay. playing the same card that the players did or the, that were involved in the uh, lawsuit that, you know, occurred the $18.9 million settlement saying that it's the com- it's completely the league's fault. It was it's not a matter of an insurance problem, it's a matter of league negligence. Even though this payment plan goes under the accordance of this revolt this goes with hockey injuries. This right. is hockey related on ice injuries that occurred and it's having long-term effects. It's the same thing with a construction worker that worked on how many ever projects during their years and they have an insurance plan and 
Well, well, I don't know. I mean, I worked on construction sites all my life. Now my knees are, you know, having to be replaced or whatever. Can you help me out? Well, you knew that you had to be there, and it's the it's the it's the problem of your of your construction company that they didn't tell you that your knees would hurt after you know you worked for however long. It's it's not the league's fault. The league is just going to what the letter of their contracts are with the insurance companies, and that's why they're taking them to court because the league has done their part. They understood the complaints of the players. They've been working with them. They are paying them for their troubles. And now it's the purpose of these insurance companies to do their part as well. All right. Yeah, that that does clear it up a little bit more. My apologies, Alex. Misheard you there. Misread it a little bit. No, no. No, no, it's com- no. I was throwing numbers at you left and right, so you're just like, all right, let me just soak this up and let me, let me think about what you just told me. This I, is what I, I think. I you feel. Just said. I know how you feel, Alex. When I just come up with a story at the last minute, just p- paste it into the outline, and then you try to react to it. And I get how you feel now. Most nights now, whenever you're out in here hosting, so I, I, I you see. For you. I see what happens. You see. You see what happens when we just throw stuff in here and just ruins everything. You throw stuff, you throw stuff in there and you're like, well, wow, you choke the hell out of the the hockey, and it's just, what? Hockey? What? Hockey! That's, that's, hockey. Why there, that's why there's some stories that hockey. literally Alex, Alex on this show sometimes will literally just be like, all right, Tyler, what is this? Go. And I go for my 10, 15 uh, it, minutes. It really go. is. And then eventually you'll, try to, you'll hear me and you'll eventually say something or Alex will do the inevitable and just repeat the same stat I read off or I set off. And he's like, yep, and that's the stat. And I'm like, I just said it. But it's OK. I understand, yeah. Alex. I, I, when I start running on, I'm, I'm just the fact that there's people that listen to these entire episodes or listen to us for long stretches. It, it's it's a testament to them, because I'll be honest with you. It's a lot of stuff we talk about. But a couple more things here before white noise. That's what it is. It is. Hey, you know what? If it relaxes people, if it's like white noise, it's there in the background. They just want to listen to us and just, you know, kind of relax and listen to us talk about hockey. I mean, see, that's the one problem. I don't think that's why we'd ever be able. That's why working in the studio, Alex, would be better because we have like hanging mics that could just throw off to the side and just start screaming, and people would still hear me. Here I have to mess around with the headset and like pull the mic down. See, we could do that, or or we could just do it like this. Ready? I'll just, I'll just listen to the pure sound of my voice. Isn't it pleasant talking about NHL hockey? No, it would be. It nice I w- it would be the Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde deal. Alex, you'd be Doctor Jekyll. You'd be reading off something. The National Hockey League is asking for more money from the players. Extra 13%. They got me next job. 13% more? What do you need that for? They're all fine. <laughs> Literally, it's how it would be. be. Every single show. And that's actually how we operate just about right now. So then again, it makes total sense. Like that uh, like that old Key and Peele skit when uh, uh, Barack Obama was president. Where, oh, no. Well, where, they did the skit, and then where, actually where, they brought Keegan-Michael Key to... <laughs> To the was it the well, last yeah. White House dinner, and Obama's yeah, getting off. The... And... Yeah, no, you're right. The presidential you're dinner, right. or whatever. By the way, update on the current game right now: three to two in the third period between Wisconsin and Penn State. The Badgers leading the net. Screw Olympics. the Badgers! What's wrong with the Badgers? What'd they ever do to you? They're not Michigan. Listen, hey, Michigan won on Saturday, Alex. They beat Rutgers after. What was it? One o'clock in the morning? Good lord! I didn't watch that game because I knew that they were probably going to blow it, and they almost did. I will say this: they I, almost I, lost to Rutgers. I was doing a lot of work because a I was getting ready for the show, and I had a lot of hockey reporting to do because there was a lot of college hockey on Saturday. If you if you guys remember from my college hockey scoreboard that I did, I got papers for it. But I I just remember. Like, watching the game, and I'm like, oh, they're going to lose to Rutgers. And they put in McNamara, and, oh, okay, they're playing well. Hey, they're in the lead. Oh, they're up by eight. Cool. Rutgers got the ball, and they're Oh, they're going to score. Yep, and they scored. And Nordine missed the field goal. Of course he – wow, their kicker missed the field goal. Well, well, maybe we will win this thing, guys. Who knows? Because Quentin Nordine, Alex, you and I both know him. He's about as reliable as San Andreas Fault during a little bit of a shakedown there in San Francisco, let me tell you. Yeah. <sighs> what a guy. Rockford, the Grand Valley States of high schools. There you go. Overrated and overhyped. Grand Pride. 
Green Pride. No, that's the that's the TCU thing, Alex. I can't I can't get that close. That's TCU is what that is. The Horn Frogs. No, this is the Horn Frog. They do the ramp, ramp. See the see the curl, ramp ride. No one wants to see the curl, Alex. No. Nope. I, listen, I, and it's funny. People that are outside of West Michigan right now probably just don't yeah. understand it. And that's okay. That's understandable. I, just think of the high school in your neck of the woods, as as uh, as Al Roker would say. Or think just, no, no. What you need to do is you need to think of the bougie country high school that spends a lot on sports. Now, just produce take a bunch that. Of now take that high school. Add in football players that are corn thin, corn red. Give them a D1 scholarship, and oh, by the way, they're still the crappiest people in the world. They're the type of people that don't tip at restaurants. Rockford doesn't tip. I was about mic to, drop. I was about in the words of Digit, mic drop. I just, I want to know. Here's the thing. The Her mic was like sitting there. You don't have a mic. No, here's my thing. Mic drop. Is I don't, I like... It's funny because like they have Rockford Brewing Company there, which is a really nice bar and stuff. And why would you not tip the bartenders? They're pouring you the beer. They could hock a loogie in your beer, and then again, they probably wouldn't notice because, you know, up there in Rockford, Alex, they got that Wolverine plant that just poisoned the water for everybody. Not quite as bad as Flint, but it's still- <laughs> yeah, boy, who's ready to get cancer at thirty? Woo! Let's go. Talking about settlement payments, let's go. <laughs> I'm ready for it. Quit doing the Katie dance. Quit doing the Katie dance there. That's yeah. That's the K dance. It's the. It just she runs like this. That's how she dances. That she got she, that from me. No, no, you did the. It, 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 do, 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 do. You did the freaking whip and nay nay and all that crud. Oh god, he's dancing, kids. He's dancing, kids. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. It's a horrible sight. No. Okay, I will say this, Alex. Do you? Yes, we're going off topic because really there's nothing more to talk about before we go to break. And we bring on Melly Dabu on the other side here at 8 o'clock here on the Kula Show here on 12. We got five minutes. Come on now. That is what Alex and I would do after, like, because when we, back when Alex did camera for me for Davenport Hockey and was my somewhat studio analyst, if you will, and whenever we did lacrosse, and we do lacrosse. I was the analyst. You were the analyst. You were a, what kind of analyst were you, Alex? What's the word we're going to use for that to describe you? I was a phenomenal analyst. Never guessed it. But, oh, holy cow, we have, we have a guest. Ladies and gentlemen, coming out of nowhere, we have Melody Dao joining us. Holy cow, out of nowhere like an RKO. Hold on, I got to quick fix a couple things here. We got three people on the show. Melody, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Uh, by the way, folks, uh, two-time Olympian. I, I wasn't ready for my intro yet. It's okay, though, because this is awesome. I can get back later if you want. Oh, no. Actually, you know what? We will go to break. We'll bring Melly Dew. Alex, uh, you kind of have to crunch down a little bit. The black screen's in the way. Alex, we'll say goodbye to you. When we come back, we'll talk to Melly Dew, two-time Olympian and member of the Pro Women's Hockey Players Association. Coming back here on the Kuehl Show here on 12 Ounce Sports.
Drink Aid, ready for distribution worldwide. <laughs> And uh, welcome back, everyone, to the Kiel Show here on 12 Ounce Sports. Tyler Kiel now joined by, now I got my intro ready to go, a member of the Pro Women's Hockey Players Association, a two-time Olympian, 2014 Olympic gold medalist, 2018 Olympic tournament MVP. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Melody Dau. Melody, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? We are doing well. Uh, we've had a very exciting show today. We've talked about women's hockey in spades today. It's a very, it's a very fun show to talk about. And obviously during these weird times, we get to talk about all sorts of things around the game, college hockey, junior hockey. And now we get to women's hockey. And this is something that when Alex, uh, my brother that you just saw there for a little bit, we were talking about a little bit earlier on the show. This is something that we like to talk about on our show because we don't think it gets the same amount of recognition, obviously, as the men's game, and which I think is a crying shame. And Melody, you're kind of right now in the middle of what we think is the peak of popularity for women's hockey. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think uh, we were on the roll last year with the NHL having 10 of us from Canada and 10 of the U.S. American at the NHL All-Star uh, weekend. And I think that itself was a big accomplishment for women's hockey. And uh, besides that, I think with the new movement of the PWHPA Association, uh, I think we're moving towards uh, what we want to achieve, which is a substantial uh, league for professional hockey players. And I think that's going to come along because uh, partners are starting to be with us and they're starting to uh, put money on our side, like we saw with Secret. I'm sure we're going to touch on that later. But um, yeah, I think we're going to, we're doing a lot of process. And I think media coverage is obviously uh, one of the biggest things thing that we need in women's hockey because if you don't see it uh you can't be it right and that and that's one thing too because we you know we were talking about how my brother and i were a little bit discussion how how different games used to be broadcasted especially in the cwhl days a lot of twitter live a lot of facebook live games just anything really to get the game out there because you know melody and you, you grew up in the same generation as we did the really the only time that a lot of people saw women's hockey was during the Olympics, especially when they came on board in 1998. And, and yeah. of course, now as it's starting to grow up, you see a lot more of the world championship battles between U.S. and Canada. Obviously, last year, Finland was able to take silver. And even Digit and I were discussing a very controversial finish to that game, but I digress. You know, <laughs> for, for you to see the point of the, where the game is just growing now to where people are watching it more than just every four years, how does that make it seem like just you realize that this le the women's hockey movement is just continuing to push forward into something that it's never seen before, at least in the women's game? Yeah, exactly. I think you just mentioned it, and that's right on point. We see women's hockey every four years, and during the, that Olympic, it's amazing how much coverage we get, how much attention women's hockey get, and you can see it right after um, everyone, the numbers in women's hockey is going up. Uh, lots of people follow it. We get a lot of positive comment about our game. And I think that's the problem after that. They don't even know, people don't even know that we're playing for the other three years in a professional hockey league. And that's where we're dropping fans and that's where it needs to be during those three years. We need to build up on to going to the Olympics. And I think that's what is missing. And I think one of the things we're looking at is the WNBA. Um, what they're doing, the partnership they have with the NBA, they have done a really, really good job. And um, we're kind of envious of what they have right now. I know they, they worked really hard, but um it's basically what we're looking for too we want to have girls that don't have to work five to five jobs at a time to make pay the bills at the end of the month and uh, i think that's going to make a huge difference 
Yeah, because you know you were there right towards the end, right at the end of the CWHL's time when it seemed like that league was hitting its peak. Games were on Sportsnet. The All Star Game was on Sportsnet. Clarkson Cup was getting the highest ratings ever. And then it got shut down. And I remember because, and I mentioned this too at the top with Digit Murphy at that time, because she had coached in the CWHL as well. I remember I said, I was like, man, I was so bummed because obviously it was great having two leagues because, you know, wrestling fan here when WCW and WWF were going at each other, it made both, both products better. When the NWHL and the CWHL were not necessarily going head to head, but when they were both going side by side, you both leagues wanted to become better so they could become either not just the superior league, but also just to grow the game in general. So when the CWHL did pull out, it really, I think, really put a kind of a gap there for a minute in the women's game. And, you know, tell about yourself here. You know, what was your reaction in 2019 right before the world championships, mind you, that the CWHL announced that it was going to close its doors? Yeah, uh, we were just on Sportnet for the final against the Inferno of Calgary. And the number of view that Sportnet got was incredible. Like they never seen that for the, uh, the CWHL. And I think that was a great achievement. It was positive. Sponsors were uh, starting to hear about us and know about us a little bit more and then we flew over to Finland for the world championship and then we had that huge announcement that was supposed to come out that we learned like the day of which was 10 minutes later we were all our team together in one room and we got the call from the CWHL uh, commissioner and we were all expecting to have like a raise in pay and like um we were expecting something big happening because of that final that got watched by so many people and then yeah they told us that there was not going to be anywhere we could play next year basically so all of us were really scared uh sad and kind of mad at the same time uh and that's where we needed to refocus for Worlds, which wasn't easy to, to do when we knew that the season, the season coming up was not going to be easy and we wouldn't have a league to play in. So it, it was a tough moment for women's hockey, that's for sure. And um, I think that since then, uh, we all uh, raised up our sleeve and went to work and uh, we tried to form something bigger and to make sure that for the next generation, there's something in place that is so solid and um, be, the girls are, are going to be able to not work and just focus on playing hockey and getting better. Yeah. Cause that was something the pro women's hockey player association, that's something that I don't want to say it came out immediately after the world championships. Cause it did take some time to formulate it and try to figure out how it was going to be put together, but it all started with the, big bomb that was dropped with the players that boycotted obviously you were being one and the thing was too the big part that i don't think a lot of us really expected melody was the fact that it wasn't just former cwhl players that didn't want to go play in the nwhl there were players in the national women's hockey league that boycotted talk about kendall coin schofield a few others those players also joined the boycott that was the biggest part and you know and like we always talk about the divide between the two leagues as now a member of that players association, seeing those players that left their, I guess you can say for sure, having a job playing in the NWHL. What did that mean to you to show that they were unified with you to say, Hey, we need to try to figure out something different. Cause right now it's not working to see the NWHL players join forces with the majority of the CWHL players. What did that mean for someone like you? Yeah, I think we got educated at the same time that it got folded. Uh, We talked a lot about why it folded and what we wanted the next league to look like. Uh, Obviously, we did look at the NWHL, but it's not something that uh, we believe that long term uh, it would be good for women's hockey. And obviously, there's no team in there was no team at the time in Canada. Now there's one, but um, you can see players that are in that league, um, like they're playing hockey, yes, but they don't have everything that we want to make happen for women's hockey. They don't have the best condition, and it would be lying to say that uh, they're living the dream over there. So we want to make sure that 
when we're going to put something forward, uh, it's going to be great. And we don't want to settle for something else just because we want to play hockey. We're looking at the little girls right now who are six, seven years old, and they're looking up to us. And they know that we're going to put our foot forward, even if it's going to cost us one, two, three years of hockey. Um, we want to make sure we're going to be the one that is going to put something in place and that we're going to speak loud to make sure that um, we're going to achieve what we want to achieve. And I think the PWHBA has done that so far, and we want to keep working towards having the best condition. And that's why when the Dream Gap Tour was announced, we, everyone got really excited. Bummed you guys didn't come to Michigan, but I digress. It's okay. I'll give you that one. It was, it was obviously got to schedule everything and whatnot. But the fact that you guys were going to go out there and take times out of your guys' schedule, because it was, I mean, yes, there was some money there, but it wasn't like it, this was going to be a massive payday for all you, all you players. You had to go out there and take time out of your time. And now, obviously, there was, you know, everyone's kind of regionally based and whatnot. It wasn't like everyone was, there were some players that would travel around. But yeah. the fact that you guys were going out and playing to show people, hey, here is some of the best talent, and you were going on like a sort of a barnstorming tour, that how what kind of an impact do you think that made on you know followers of women's hockey or even people that don't follow women's hockey too much that try to get them interested and kind of see what you guys were trying to accomplish with the dream gap tour yeah it's it's crazy to think that the best 200 players are part of the pwhpa and the dream gap tour so if people want to see the best on best women's hockey they got to look at us. We're about 38 Olympians uh, in total. Right now, we're about 135 players uh, divided in six teams. So the Dream Gap Tour is really to go around places where they're ready to host us. And we're ready to go there uh, on our own time because we want to promote women's hockey to as many people as possible, to little girls, to little boys, to parents, um, to dads and moms. And I think that's what we got to do. We got to showcase the best women's hockey and showcase our product. And I think from there, people are just going to become uh, part of our, our, our goal, our commitment to producing that new league. And I think that's big. And there's big sponsors who did believe in us in the previous year, uh, like Secrets and uh, Dunkin' Donut. So, like, it's crazy to think that it's going to happen at one point. We just need to manage, like, when it's going to happen. Right. And, I mean, you know, Dunkin' Donuts is okay and all, but at least there's something there, right? Because, I mean, Tim Hortons is better, but that's just I think <laughs> just me. I may be in the minority Weiser, with... You're a Budweiser fan, right? I, I will drink Budweiser if it's free, but I will be, I'd be lying if I didn't say I had a whole case of Molson Canadian in my fridge right now. That is not just me trying to be a suck up. I literally do ask my brother. He's, my wife had to buy it for me because all, all of the supermarkets around here were out of it, but she found a case of two for it because apparently all dressed chips, that's not a thing down here. They don't like to do that. Molson Canadian, they barely have any in stock. So I'm always kind of clamoring, scavenging for good stuff around here. As, as you can tell, Melody, I, I kind of like Canada a little bit. I lived up actually in, in Lucknow, Ontario for parts of a couple of seasons, played senior league hockey, which for the, I mean, if the equivalent, obviously we didn't make any money doing it, but, you know, having to work jobs and try to be competitive athlete, that's kind of what you guys are going through right now. And with the Dream Gap Tour, having sponsors backing you guys up, because obviously these are not free events. You need to be able to buy ice and get the players to come out. And now having yeah. Secret with a $1 million commitment. Doesn't matter what brand it is. Who cares what it is? It's the fact that there is a there is big companies out there that want to put big money into women's hockey. And you talk about 10 years ago, even with the great 2010 Vancouver Games when Canada beats the United States, both in men's and women's hockey, at that time, professional women's hockey was still kind of a dream because there was no money there for it outside of the Olympics, like we talked off the top here. Now there yeah. is a company that wants women's hockey to flourish and wants it to be around 365 days out of the year. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, from when you were a kid, from when I was a kid, that was an unheard of feat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it it is a 
a huge commitment for a company like this to to commit to women's hockey when there's nothing right now and secret zero Durant really like helped us out all last year and for they went on the their radar they give us a lot of money and this year they come out with that huge commitment and i think everyone around the world like said wow this is amazing for women's hockey finally a huge commitment is putting not little pennies but a lot of dollars on the table for us to uh, grow the game and i think that's that's big for us and uh, it's gonna allow a lot of us to do more things for for the pwhpa and hopefully my my biggest dream would be to see other companies step up like they did and i think if other companies step up uh, for sure we're gonna have a league where um people like you media is gonna jump on board and um i think there's gonna be a lot of um money that is gonna come back to them after that well i'd say we like to make a financial contribution ourselves but i i lost my dollar that i had over here so i don't know if i can make much right now uh, but obviously, like I said, just just talking about the game, too, that's the biggest part. And that's what kind of led to the idea of not just having in 2018, having Kendall Coyne and Brianna Decker and Nurse go out there for the skills competition, but actually have you guys compete at the All-Star game at the, on the skills competition day. But have you guys compete? And before we get to the game and the event, people, there were some people saying, why couldn't it just be some of the Dream Gap tourists, maybe some European players over? I have to remind people. Melody, that the reason why there was U.S. versus Canada and the reason why I made such a big deal about it on the show leading up to that event is because it is U.S. and Canada. And in the men's game, it's kind of iffy on how the rivalry is. Obviously, the gold medal game 2010 was great. Some world, There's been a lot of classic world junior battles for the men's side. But the women's hockey battle between U.S. and Canada, ever since the first world championships back in 1990, it has been fierce. It has been ferocious. It has been entertaining to watch. We saw it in the 14 Olympic Games when Mary Philippe Poulin, the team that you were on, won it in overtime. We saw it in 2018 where, yes, Canada came up short, but you pulled off the sick goal in the shootout, the nice Forsberg there. The U.S.-Canada rivalry, I will say this, and I've, I don't promote it enough, which is a shame on me, in terms outside the NHL rivalries, it's probably the biggest rivalry in hockey today. Is that kind of the same mindset for you, or am I just being alone in this one? Yeah, no, that's totally true. Like, we see it with the PWHPA. We're able to make three teams in Canada and three teams in U.S. That's the depth of players we have in Canada and USA. Um, and everyone could be on the Olympic team in those three teams. So um, there's a lot of good female hockey player out there. And I got to say that Finland is – getting very strong like we've seen uh, in the last world championship we need to give them all our respect and we need to train even harder to make sure that this doesn't happen again for us to finish third in a world championship but um, I think you're totally right when we play the U.S. Um, they bring the best out of us and we bring the best out of them and um, there's some fights almost every game we play them and some brawls. And I think that's, it's just heat up. Like you step on the ice, you see their Jersey and right away, like friendships are over and it's right away in the rivalry. See, that's why I was bummed. It wasn't a five on five game. Cause we may have seen some of that, the skills competition. I mean, and now going to the game, you know, you look at the talent level on both sides. It was the best on best three on three. And it was, I mean, it was more or less, yeah, you pretty much both the teams from the 2018 teams respectively going up against each other. And there was still some bad blood from that tournament, you know, just going, you know, Melanie, what was it? Your just kind of your reaction when they said, Hey, we're going to do a three on three game at the skills competition and Melody, we want you to be part of it. What did that mean to you that knowing that all eyes were going to be on Canada, U.S., 10 players per team on what, what yes, everyone, there's talk that the skills competition is not as big as it used to be. I, I think that's a load of BS, if you ask me. But what was it like to knowing that the spotlight was going to be on women's hockey during the NHL, during an NHL event? What did that mean to you? Funny enough, when I received that email, I thought they were going to throw a three-on-three -three tournament at another ring during the NHL All-Star weekend, oh, but geez. we would just like, 
see them. And then at one point, they kind of came up with that plan that it was going to be at the same time. So I was so excited personally to be part of it. But also, I was so happy for women's hockey. I think that was huge for uh, from the NHL to do that to support women's hockey that way and to give us for the first time ever um, we were going to play a hockey game three on three at a time where everyone was going to watch that that's one thing like when we play at the olympics in the final against us we play at what 2 a.m here so people are sleeping or they're going to get up but it's not right there in in front of their eyes so for the NHL, obviously, everyone is watching the NHL. It's a huge platform. So we needed to, to show up. And we made that commitment in between the U.S. and Canada team that we were going to show up and give our best. And there was not going to be any uh, dump and chase or whatever. It was just going to be high-paced game. And it was. It was probably one of the hardest game I played in because it was three-on-three, three, nonstop, no whistles um, for 220 minutes. So it was... It was pretty intense, um, but yeah, it was it was amazing to play in front of a packed rink in St. Louis, uh, having all the best NHL guys in the rink watching our game. That was pretty special. I I will say this quickly going back to the 2018 game. I I did t- I did take a nap. I woke up at midnight. I watched the entire game. I was bummed. I was. My grandmother asked me why, because I was at my grandmother's at the time. She asked me why I was yelling at 2.30 in the morning. And I'm like, because a gold medal should not be decided on a shootout. But that's just me. That's for another show. But yep. going to that three-on-three game, it it was so – and it, here's the thing, too. You think three-on-three, it's going to be like eight, nine, nine, eight, ten, you know, so many goals. That game was really, really tight. You yourself got ended up credit with the game-winning goal gain, a pass from your former late Canadian teammate, Marie-Philippe Poulin, back there. And – and Dave Bien played so well for Canada, for you guys in goal. Like, the game was tight, intense, and it was fun to watch because it wasn't just a, you know, typical NHL all-star game where it's just, you know, yeah. oh, let's, let's not, let's not, let's take it easy, guys. Let's not hurt each other. You guys went hard, and it made for great hockey. Exactly, and it comes back to what I said earlier. Every time we face each other, whether it's a friendly game, a game that has no medal at the end of the day, or it is a championship or an Olympic final game, we're always going to give our best. And it was so awkward because in the dressing room, we were in the same dressing room. Oh, so before, yeah, for before the game, we would see them on the other side and making like little plays, and same thing for us. And it, then. When we came back in the dressing room after the game, we were like all giggly and laughing and not trying to hurt their feeling too much because <laughs> they wanted to win too. And we could see they were so pissed. And that's like, it shows like it would have been the same thing if they would have won, we would have been pissed in the dressing room after. So I think it shows that every game we're going to give our best. And at the same time, it was not a time to go and drag our feet on the ice. We needed to showcase women's hockey and every time we do get an opportunity to to showcase uh, our sport I think it's really important for us to do our best and uh, try to bring as many fans as possible to to like our sport and enjoy watching it now here is the idea this is really just a spur of the moment idea I, okay I've, I probably thought about it in the past but it just came to my brain now Next All-Star game, whatever that may be, whether it be 2021, 2023, because I think the NHL wants to go back to the Olympics in 2022, knock on wood. But having either one of two options, Melody, tell me which one you like more. Having a PWHPA game before or after the NHL All-Star game, after the whole tournament, or in between to let the players rest, obviously, if they continue with the three-on-three format they have now. Full game, five-on-five, let the best players play. Or have you girls go play with the teams in the NHL? Because I'm just saying right now, you and Kendall Coyne and even Philippe Poulin, like having you guys out there, you may show some of them guys up. I'll be honest with you. (laughs) Wow, that's tough. But I think like in the summer when we train in our own cities, uh, we do train with some of the boys and, um we give them a, a hard time at the same time when we play three on three for fun at the end of a game or five on five for training uh it's awesome to be able to play with them and at the end of the day they're 
they don't think and they don't see us as female hockey player. They see us as hockey player. And um, you've seen it, like Kendall Korn is faster than most NHL players. So like they got to respect that. And I think, no, we don't have the hardest shot like they do because of women's and men's. We will never be able to compare both uh, gender in hockey. But I think, yeah, it would be awesome. I think I would go with option number two and I would love them to try really hard. Like I wouldn't want them to just like go out there and have fun. I would love to play a game with them where we can actually like play uh hard and make some plays. I am going to, so I, I accidentally have come across an email of one of the higher ups in the league. I don't know if, if my emails ever go straight to a spam, but I'm going to try to email. I'm like, I got an idea guys. It may make everyone a lot of money because that's what I do here on the show. <laughs> I make everyone a lot of money. So what I did with digit Murphy, cause something she does on her Instagram is 37 seconds for title nine because 37 title nine is only 37 words. In 37 seconds here, Melody Do, give us the reason why. Obviously, we've pretty much talked about it in spades, but give us a quick summary in 37 seconds why people should invest their time, should pay attention more, and to watch women's hockey. I would say you're going to love it. It's plain and simple. It's You're going to love our sport. It's There's some contacts. There's some amazing plays. And if you like hockey, you're going to like us. And I think that's what we need to remember. Whether you like men's or female hockey, uh, you're gonna like both because we play the same sport. And it's you're gonna like um, how much creativity you're gonna see on the ice. And I think people do care about women's hockey. They just don't know how to invest their money in us. And I think it would be amazing if uh, more companies with the uh, come on board and follow what secret zero Duran just did. That may have been over 37 seconds, but I wasn't keeping count. It was, that was exactly I talk about it. I don't keep, I, I just know when we're supposed to go off the air. That's all I know here on the Kula show here on 12 ounce sports. We have been talking with Melody Dau. Melody. This has been awesome. This whole episode has been great for us and everyone that's watching. I'm sure. I mean, if anyone just, if, they, if anyone could see all this interview with Melody, if they're just tuning in, I apologize. You missed a heck of an interview, but they can watch the replay on the QL shows, YouTube tomorrow. And of course, all of your favorite podcasts will be up on there. Be sure to follow Melody Dau at Mela Dau. So it's M E L and then Dau, like her last name, D A O U S T. Make sure you follow her. Uh, number 15 as well at the end of that, her number. Because also, you can also get her awesome swag. Her awesome MB15 hat swag. Ooh. Melody got that. Put it up there for everyone to see. Look at that. It's even, even though she played for Lake Canadian, guys, and she's from Montreal, that is Maple Leaf Blue. I can take that one to the bank. <laughs> yeah. You can also custom your hat. So you can choose a color you want, a flat rim or a fitted or 47 and do your own color of logo. So, it's so what you're telling me is blue and white's the best. Gotcha. Okay. I just had to make sure on that one, but well, I like red and white, but red and white, Hey, red and white's a pretty good color. I think for everybody. I mean, I, I, I can't really say much here. This Canada mug, this Canada, I got a, <laughs> I got a can my stepmother's from London, Ontario. So I mean, well, excuse me, St. Thomas lived in London over there. So, but regardless, follow Melody on Instagram. Follow us on The Keel Show at The Keel Show. Hashtag TKS. Me- Talking Myers coming up with the rando coming up here next on 12 Ounce Sports. Melody, once again, thank you very much. I'm gl- Thank yeah. you for taking the time out of your day, out of your night of the week mm-hmm. here to talk with us about women's hockey. It was definitely a fun time to talk to you. Thank you for having me on and best of luck with your show oh thank you very much it probably won't get much better than this but you know what if we hit our peak let's just hope <laughs> women's hockey hasn't hit their peak there's a lot more to go for women's hockey for melody Dau, i'm tyler Kuhl saying thank you all we'll see you all next time here on the Kuhl show <laughs>